In the journal of the 501st, a veteran of the 501st Legion remarked that while the 501st had gotten the best of the war, it had also gotten the worst. However, that wasn't entirely true. The reserve units that got to kick back in the core worlds probably had it better, we'd say, and there were certainly units who saw worse than the 501st ever did. In particular, the 327 Star Corps had a much harsher list of assignments, facing long odds and hellish conditions from Genosis to Felucia. No other unit could claim to have suffered worse than the 327th. But why was that? Why did the 327th keep getting stuck with all the nasty missions? In this video, we'll answer that question. The 327th Star Corps was a detachment of the 2nd Sector Army, one of the 6 Sector Armies based in the Core Worlds. Since its own territory was pretty much insulated from Separatist attack, at least in the early months of the war, many of the 2nd Sector Army's component units were deployed to reinforce the beleaguered Sector Armies fighting in the Outer Rim. The 327th was one such unit, frequently dispatched to hot zones to stem the bleeding. Following the Battle of Hypori, the 327th came under the command of Jedi General Ayla Sakura, one of the Order's most skilled fighters. Clone Marshal Commander CC5052, nicknamed Bly, became her clone liaison. The two became a great team. Bly's unwavering focus on the mission contrasted well with Sakura's unorthodox tactics and ingenuity, allowing the 327th to overcome virtually any situation. Typically, Bly would trust Sakura to come up with an overarching plan, and Sakura would trust Bly to figure out the best way to get it done. The General's command, as Bly said, and the clones implement. By the end of the war, the clones of the 327th were among the most skilled in the Grand Army of the Republic. The unit's veterans were well known for their expertise at fighting in hostile environments, and many of the 327th's elite cadre had ARC Trooper training. It's unknown whether these clones were full ARC Troopers, whether they had been through Alpha 17's commander training program, or whether they had just received snippets of training from Bly or another of Alpha's students, but they were highly skilled and used ARC Trooper equipment such as Kamas and Command Pauldrons. Most of the clones within the 327th Star Corps wore armor with yellow stripes, a trend that appears to have been started by Commander Bly, who kept his yellow commander stripes after the transition between Phase 1 and Phase 2 armor. To us, yellow and white doesn't seem like it would be the best color scheme for action in hostile environments, but it appears to have worked well enough for the 327th. The 327th had an extremely long combat history, starting right at the beginning of the Clone Wars. It was one of the five full cores that fought in Genosis, where it suffered heavy casualties. The 327th component unit, Hawkbat Battalion, was almost completely wiped out in a clash with a column of homing spider droids. Despite the many casualties sustained at Genosis, however, the battle ended in a Republic victory and the 327th Star Corps limped off to the next battlefield. For the 327th, this first fight set the tone for the next three years of the war. Early in the war, the 327th was assigned to General Ayla Sakura, who led the unit on a series of campaigns across the Outer Rim. Many of these early missions were ill-fated, most notably the Sky Battle of Quell. During the battle, Separatist warships ambushed and destroyed General Sakura's fleet in the atmosphere of the planet Quell. The men of the 327th could do little as their Star Destroyers fell apart around them and Super Battle Droids boarded to mop up the survivors. Most of the unit escaped the disastrous defeat at Quell thanks to Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano, but the unit was scattered in the aftermath. Sakura, Bly, and a few others were stranded on Maridun, where they had to fight another battle just to regroup with the rest of the Corps. Fortunately for them, the Battle of Maridun went better than Quell had, though, again, the 327th suffered some serious casualties. 21 BBY brought the 327th to Alzoc III, Florum, and New Holstice. In the latter battle, the 327th was absolutely massacred by the Separatist-aligned Mandalorian protectors. The Republic ultimately won the battle, but by its end, the 327th had been cut down to 60% strength, which was pretty nuts for a unit of 36,000 men. Despite the losses, the 327th kept fighting. They had no other choice. They battled the armies of Asajj Ventress in the haunted swamps of Dramund Kaas, facing hostile conditions and opposition by Darkseid Prophets as they went. 
In 20 BBY, the 327th suffered heavy casualties yet again in the Battle of Honaga, in which the Corps had to hack through thick jungles and face swift death at the hands of Nogri warriors to retrieve a key piece of equipment. During the Outer Rim sieges, the 327th Star Corps played a crucial role in two of the most grueling battles of the war. In the Siege of Seleucami, the 327th and two other elite corps fought in a constant back and forth war against the Mogukai Shadow Army, a separatist clone army trained by Anzati master assassins to kill Jedi. Casualties on Seleucami were staggering, but the 327th kept fighting for five long months, unwilling to let the Shadow Army escape and participate in other theaters of the war. The Republic eventually won the battle, but the 327th was redeployed to another siege just a few days after. As you all know well, the final battle of the Clone Wars was, for the 327th, the Battle of Felucia. On Felucia, the 327th Star Corps was called in to do what many other units had failed to, capture the main stronghold of the Commerce Guild. In the jungles of Felucia, the 327th faced vicious accolades, flesh-eating disease, and an enemy far more familiar with the terrain than the clones were. Nonetheless, they pushed on and gained the upper hand in the battle, albeit at a high cost. By the time Order 66 came and the Clone Wars ended, Bly and his men were well on their way to capturing Felucia for good. Those were some pretty nasty battles. The 327th emerged victorious from some, and some they conceded to the Seps. But what's interesting is less the individual battles and more the connections between them. Who in Republic High Command hated the 327th so much that they sent the boys in yellow to Dramon Kass, Honaga, Seleucami, and Felucia? If they'd been on Jabim and on Bara as well, then the 327th would have seen every single one of the Republic's worst battles. That's not very fair, but there's a reason the 327th kept getting the garbage assignments. They could handle them. Again and again, the 327th got absolutely mauled, but they survived every time. Those members of the Corps who survived gained plenty of experience across a wide range of environments, thus making the 327th a natural choice for other hostile environments. When you had a unit that had survived the desert flats of Genosis, the swamps of Jumunkas, the jungles of Honaga, and the calderas of Seleucami, wouldn't they be the natural pick to send to the fungus forests of Felucia? The reason the 327th racked up so much experience so quickly was that they were simply some of the first to get any. As we mentioned earlier, they were one of just five corps to fight on Genosis. In the early months of the war, the Republic had to deal with a thousand battlefronts opening up at the same time, and they only had a few units experienced enough to handle the worst fronts. Thus, the 327th was dispatched to the hot zones where they suffered more and endured more casualties than other units. As the war went on and the Republic deployed millions of new clones, Republic strategists reserved the worst battlefields for the toughest and most experienced units. And thus, the 327th got sent into hell again and again. They were first to fight and they kept on surviving, so they were given the very worst of the Clone Wars. That sounds like a pretty raw deal if you ask us, but then again, being a slave soldier grown in a vat to die far from everything you've ever known is already a raw deal, so what do we know? A unit is only as strong as the bonds that bind it together. Most clone units in the Grand Army of the Republic developed such bonds through shared experience and trauma, becoming stronger after each battle they survived. Most Star Wars fans are familiar with the Fighting 501st or even the 212th Attack Battalion, both of which suffered devastating losses since they were always on the front lines, but neither of them went through the terrible loss the 104th Wolfpack Battalion experienced. As many of us know, the Wolfpack was nearly wiped out in the Battle of Abrogado, but through its suffering, the Wolfpack developed the strongest bond of any unit in the GAR. In this video, we'll be sharing their story. While Jedi Generals led most missions, their clone battalions did most of the actual groundwork. A battalion was composed of four companies, with a total of 576 clone troopers led by a Jedi and a clone commander. Each company was composed of four platoons, each with four squads of nine troopers. While all clones were by nature identical, the Jedi encouraged freedom of expression and individuality in their men, leading to many battalions having their own distinctive armor, colors, symbols, practices, culture, and specialization. 
Some battalions, like the 212th, were focused on conducting rapid strikes on enemy targets, while others, like the 41st Scout Battalion, were focused on reconnaissance. There was further specialization within battalions as certain squads were equipped for bomb defusal, aerial missions, intelligence gathering, or even sabotage. It wasn't uncommon for the Jedi to combine battalions to take down hard targets or separatist occupied worlds. This tended to cause friction between different clone units as they did not always agree on the best course of action, but their commanders usually kept them in line. The 104th Wolfpack Battalion was led by CT3636, also known as Commander Wolf and Jedi Master Plo Koon. The two of them led the 104th through numerous campaigns and missions, usually coming out on top. While often being assigned to rescue and relief missions, the men of the 104th earned the nickname Wolfpack because of how ferociously they fought and how they hunted their enemies as a team. In the early stages of the Clone Wars, their armor was distinguished by its maroon color and wolf markings. In the early days of the Clone Wars, the 104th were deployed on the planet Kormendi to retake the Nexus, a trading outpost floating over the planet's surface from Separatist control. Their mission was twofold, capture the outpost and rescue the hostage the Separatists were holding there. Wat Tambor, the foreman of the Techno Union, had taken the facility and its custodian Orkle hostage and was overconfident in the station's defense systems. Led by Plo Koon in a Jedi Starfighter, the 104th scrambled Arc 170s to engage the enemy forces and provide cover for a stealth mission assigned to the Wolfpack. Commander Wolf, alongside Sinker Comet and Boost, secretly infiltrated the base with jetpacks while the dogfight ensued. Their mission was going smoothly until they accidentally triggered the base defenses and were ambushed by D1 series aerial battle droids. True to their name, they fought like wolves, destroyed all the droids and eventually cornered Wat Tambor. Rather than accept defeat and surrender, Tambor chose to initiate the base's self-destruct sequence and escape. The wolf pack successfully saved Orkle and were picked up by Plo Koon just as the base exploded. Commander Wolf expressed his disappointment that they had failed their mission to capture the base, but Plo Koon pointed out that he had saved the hostage and not lost any of his men. While this battle showed how the 104th could hold their own against the Seppis, they usually worked alongside other clone battalions. During the Siege of Hassin, Commander Wolf, Captain Rex, and Commander Cody were separated from their Jedi generals by Count Dooku, and the men of the 104th found themselves fighting alongside the 501st and the 212th in the planet's jungles. The Wolf Pack successfully rescued the Separatist hostages with the help of Boyle and Waxer from the 212th. However, as they were escaping, they found themselves surrounded by battle droids, and a heated battle ensued. Commander Wolf saved Heater and Twitch of the 501st after they were hit by enemy fire. These events showcased the dedication the 104th had to their brothers regardless of what unit they were from. This spirit of cooperation continued throughout the war as they would later rescue the 501st and 212th in the First Battle of Felucia. Tasked with hunting General Grievous, the 104th tracked the Separatist General to the Abrogado system with a fleet of Star Destroyers and found his new flagship, the Malevolence. As they tried to call for Republic reinforcements, they were hit by the Malevolence's main weapon, a massive ion cannon that rendered the entire fleet defenseless to turbo laser fire. Understanding the hopelessness of their situation, Plo Koon ordered a full evacuation and all the clones rushed to the escape pods. Plo Koon himself escaped in a pod with Wolf and two other clones. They watched in horror as the droids sent out pod hunters to kill any clone survivors. When the droids came for them, they exited the pod and destroyed the hunters. This battle was devastating. The 104th lost all but three of their members before the survivors were rescued by Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano. Wolf changed the battalion's color to a blue-gray to honor their fallen brothers, and the ranks of the 104th were later replenished with new recruits. Wolf made sure he instilled these shinies with the same ferocity, loyalty, and brotherhood the original wolf pack possessed. The Battle of Abrogado was the fire from which the Phoenix rose, and the reborn 104th went on to fight in the Second Battle of Felucia. The Unity also conducted rescue and relief missions on Vanquor, Kadavo, and Alin. The men of the 104th would adapt to any situation or environment thrown at them, even the coldest of assignments or the worst leadership. 
Sometime after the Siege of Essene, the 104th, along with Captain Ozul and the Jedi Masters Plo Koon, Tout, and Kit Fisto, were sent to the icy planet Korm. Their mission was to secure the valuable Argosite mineral and free Kormai slave miners from Asajj Ventress and a local Kormai warlord. Donning cold assault gear, the 104th worked with the Devil Dogs from the 44th Special Operations Division, known for their ability to blow stuff up. The Republic was only able to deploy a small part of its forces before a planetary storm blocked any additional reinforcements. Supported by some ATTEs, the Jedi and clones advanced toward the Separatists. When their ATTE column was struck by cannon fire, Captain Ozul ordered the clones to scatter, but this only led to more troops getting picked off. Fortunately, the Jedi were able to rally their troops and push the droids back. After cleaning up all remaining droid resistance, they set up a command center to discuss their plan of attack. While Ozul suggested a full frontal attack, the Jedi shot the plan down and criticized him for not caring about his men. When they received word that the Separatists were able to land more reinforcements despite the storm, the Jedi realized there must have been a weather control station that was creating an artificial storm and that they had to destroy it. The group split up. Master Tort and Captain Ozul stayed to defend the base with the main force, while Masters Kit Fisto and Plo Koon took a small contingent of the 104th and Devil Dogs to take down the satellite dish. Ventress used this opportunity to launch an attack on the Republic base and killed Master Tort, meaning Ozul was now in charge. When the droids appeared to retreat, he commanded his troops to chase after them, even after Wolf argued that their orders were to defend the base. Many clones were killed when commando droids, buried under the snow, ambushed them, leading Ozul to surrender despite his clones warning him that the Separatists didn't take prisoners. When Ventress arrived, Ozul demanded that he be treated as a prisoner of war, but she started killing clones and threatening to make him next if he didn't reveal the other Jedi's whereabouts. Wolf told him to keep his mouth shut, but the coward Ozul spilled the beans. Ventress nearly killed him and his men anyway, but the Kormai warlord convinced her to keep them alive since he thought they would be useful later. Meanwhile, Ventress ambushed the Jedi and created an avalanche to bury the Republic forces, thinking they were already dead. She returned to the base unaware that the Jedi had survived under the snow by using the Force to make a protection bubble. At the same time, Wolf, Ozul, and a few clones commandeered a Separatist tank and escaped the facility, returning to their staging ground. Ozul tried to defend his betrayal of the Jedi to Wolf, saying he saved the clones' lives, but Wolf retorted that Ozul was just saving his own skin. When they re-emerged from the snow, the Jedi realized they had lost the explosives they were supposed to destroy the station with. The clones and the Kormai started to panic, but the Jedi reassured them, saying they just had to get creative. They eventually reached the weather station and turned the storm on the station itself, clearing the way for Republic reinforcements. While Ozul, thinking that the Jedi were dead, ordered bombers to attack the Separatist base, the cannons were loaded with Argosite, which took down many of the Republic's air support. Upon joining the battle, Kit Fisto rushed to take out the cannons while Plo Koon went to save the hostages. Furious, Ventress attempted to set the base to self-destruct, but Plo Koon used the force to knock the detonator from her hand. Before she could reach for it, Wolf destroyed the detonator with his blaster. Plo Koon called for Ventress to surrender, but she instead gouged out Wolf's eye with a lightsaber and escaped in the confusion. Despite losing a large number of troops because of Ozul's incompetence, the 104th emerged victorious, and Wolf came out with a gnarly scar. Star Wars The Clone Wars introduced us to a ton of new clone trooper variants, some cool and some forgettable. Some of these variants only appeared in a few episodes, and the variant we'll be discussing today only appeared in one. We're talking, of course, about Stealth Operations Clone Troopers, a variant of the already rare Special Operations Clone Troopers. They wore sleek black armor and looked cool as the Nine Corellian Hells, and they're often forgotten by Clone Wars fans since they only appeared in the early stages of the Battle of Christosis. But why was that the case? Were they just too cool for us? In this video, we're going to try and answer these questions. First, let's get the most important question out of the way. Yes, stealth troopers were definitely way too cool for us mere mortals. 
They were probably too cool for the rest of the Grand Army of the Republic as well, as necessitated by their stealth training. Since these guys were basically black ops, it's a fair bet that they were isolated from their normie brethren by the Kaminoans and by their eventual commanders, and as a result, they were likely just as rare and mysterious in-universe as they are out of universe. This idea is reinforced by the fact that they worked with highly classified technology like the Republic's stealth ship. We know precious little about these guys, just like we know precious little about Spec Ops clones in general. However, it's a reasonable assumption that they were trained in stealth tactics, both on the ground and aboard stealth ships, and we know for a fact that operating stealth ships was part of their repertoire. There were a variety of specialized roles under the banner of stealth ops, including clone stealth pilots and stealth ops commanders. Since they were trained in working with stealth ships, we can assume they were trained in the use of other stealth related experimental technologies as well. These probably included chameleon systems and personal stealth field generators. We have names for exactly two stealth ops clones, the Rookie CT1284, nicknamed Spark, and Stealth Ops Commander Blackout. Believe it or not, we can actually glean a few more bits of information about the Stealth Ops from them. Since Blackout was a clone commander, we can determine that there was at least a full battalion of Stealth Ops troopers, which is to say that there were 576 at minimum. Additionally, Spark being a rookie means that the Stealth Ops were actively receiving new members a few months into the Clone Wars, meaning they weren't a one-time batch like the Clone Commandos were. Lastly, we can determine that they did see a fair bit of action since Blackout had proved himself enough to earn a set of J-Guys for his helmet. However, we only know of one instance in which these guys definitely saw action. That was during the early stages of the Battle of Christosis, in which Anakin Skywalker used a prototype stealth ship, an IPV-2C stealth corvette, to break Admiral Trench's blockade of the planet. That stealth ship was crewed by stealth ops clones, who operated everything from the ship's cloaking device to communications. Since this stealth ship was only crewed by a total of 12 clones, however, it's doubtful that it was the sort of assignment most stealth ops troops were given. With that said, we don't know of any others, though that might just mean that the boys in black were really good at their jobs. But the most likely answer to a given question is often the simplest one, and with that in mind, we would bet that we didn't see the stealth ops troopers much because they didn't see much action. We have our reasons for this theory too. Stealth ops troopers appear to have been primarily concerned with stealth related technology like the stealth ship seen at Christosis. However, that equipment was extremely rare and difficult to acquire, even for the Galactic Republic itself. This was especially true of cloaking devices, a vital component of stealth ships. Cloaking devices were the only stealth technology that would have been practical on a large scale for the GAR. Personal stealth generators or chameleon units might have been more accessible, but they were also a bit redundant. Many Jedi knew various force concealment techniques which didn't have manufacturing costs and generally didn't suffer from equipment malfunctions. So the Republic likely would have sent Jedi on stealth missions if those sorts of measures were necessary. Thus, stealth ships were probably the primary domain of the stealth ops troopers, which would explain why we almost never saw them. During the Clone Wars, stealth ships were exceedingly rare. Both sides had a handful of them. We've already talked about the Republic's prototype Corvette and the Confederacy had stealth ships too, of which a few saw use as skirmishers in the Battle of Prey Sitlin, but both the Republic and the Confederacy used the ships sparingly due to a galactic scale shortage of one crucial component of most cloaking devices, Stygium Crystals. There were a variety of ways to cloak a starship. The simplest was to just turn the whole ship off, making it look like a piece of debris unless enemy craft got close enough. But that was rarely a viable strategy for obvious reasons, so better ways of masking ships were developed. What exactly these devices did varied. The most widely available cloaking technologies just masked a ship's energy readouts and signal outputs so that scanners couldn't pick them up. Of course, those sorts of equipment generally weren't considered real cloaking devices since ships employing them were still visible to the naked eye. Chameleon devices were a bit closer to what people thought of when they pictured cloaking devices. 
These used sophisticated holographic arrays to essentially hide ships behind images of what lay behind them, effectively rendering them invisible to the naked eye. Of course, this had the opposite problem as sensor masking technology. Scanners could easily break through chameleon cloaks, and even the naked eye could see through these pseudo cloaks in the right circumstances. True cloaking devices rendered starships completely invisible, both to the naked eye and to nearly all kinds of scanners. Conventionally, they were only possible to manufacture with the use of stygium. These rare and highly unusual crystals bent radiation wavelengths, which allowed it to disrupt natural light and baffle a wide variety of sensor systems. Stygium was tricky to refine and harness, but when properly implemented, it produced near-perfect starship cloaks. However, stygium crystals were only found on three planets in the entire galaxy. The traditional source of stygium was Aten II, a shadowy world of the Triton Nebula, where the crystals were first discovered. Small caches also existed on the remote rimworld Maramir and the unknown region's colony 244 Core, but neither was a reliable source. 244 Core was almost completely inaccessible and had very small stygium deposits, and Maramir was controlled by unsavory types, first the Trade Federation, and then a bunch of pirate gangs who sold primarily to the black market to get around strict Republic regulations. By the time of the Clone Wars, both of these stygium caches had run dry, leaving eight and two as the only remaining source of the crystals. There was an issue with that as well, however. By the time of the Clone Wars, eight and two had been mined for stygium for thousands of years, and it too was beginning to run dry. Both the Republic and the Confederacy had to make do with the small stores of stygium that they had, as odds were, that was all they were getting. Of course, both factions together with the Huts and Black Sun continued to mine eight and two regardless, hoping to hit undiscovered stygium caches, but they had no such luck. All of these factions fought a battle over eight and two during the Clone Wars, the Battle of Dryton, in which the dangers of the Dryton Nebula wreaked havoc on all sides involved. It had the ominous distinction of having the highest casualty rate of any Clone Wars battle, as all forces involved in the Battle of Dryton disappeared without a trace a month into the battle. Shortly afterwards, the mines of Aten II were officially declared dry. The galaxy would have to go without new caches of stygium until 3 ABY, when the Empire got sick of Aten II's stinginess and cracked the planet open with a super laser. All told, stygium crystals were a rarity in the Clone Wars. Thus, cloaking devices were a rarity, as were stealth ships by extension, as, of course, were stealth operations clone troopers too. The existence of at least a full battalion of stealth ops troopers was likely just wishful thinking on the part of the Republic. No doubt, High Command had dreams of a fleet of stealth ships and wanted to train men to be able to man such a fleet just in case. While the 501st Legion is undeniably the most iconic clone unit in Star Wars, the 212th Attack Battalion and its parent unit, the 7th Sky Corps, come in second place. Known for their orange armor paint jobs and their loyalty to Obi-Wan Kenobi, the clones of the 7th Sky Corps were highly skilled and made regular appearances on the front lines of the Clone Wars. From the conflict's first months to the end of the Outer Rim sieges, the 7th Sky Corps and its component units played a major role in the Clone Wars, and in this video, we're going to be going through the full timeline of their engagements. The 7th Sky Corps was the most well-known corps in the 3rd Systems Army, one of the Grand Army of the Republic's largest subdivisions. And it was the unit assigned to High General Obi-Wan Kenobi after his promotion to the Jedi Council. The 7th Sky Corps was commanded by Marshal Commander CC-2224, better known as Cody, and as the unit's name suggests, the Corps specialized in aerial insertions and fast attack tactics. As a Corps, it contained 36,864 clone troopers in total, 567 of which were members of the 212th Attack Battalion, a famous elite unit that often fought in the front lines of the 7th Sky Corps' battles. The 212th itself contained Ghost Company, which accompanied General Kenobi himself in the early stages of several major battles, as well as the 2nd Airborne Company, a unit of clone airborne troopers. 
The 7th Sky Corps, especially the 212th Attack Battalion, tended to be assigned to campaigns where the Republic was on the offensive, and the clones in these units specialised in invasions and sieges. In several notable battles, the 212th Attack Battalion was sent to break the siege of an enemy-held fortress or capital city. Many units within the 7th Sky Corps were composed of airborne troopers who were issued specialised helmets, parachutes and jetpacks designed to allow them to perform high-altitude drops onto enemy positions. Many of the non-paratrooper clones in the 7th Sky Corps were still trained in the use of jetpacks, and some of them, most notably Commander Cody himself, incorporated jetpacks into their standard kit. It's worth noting that this makes the 7th Sky Corps the heirs to one of the Republic's most ancient military traditions, the Rocket Jumpers, a famed unit of the original Republic military that acted as the spearhead of Republic ground forces for 10,000 years. Like the airborne troopers of the 212th, the Rocket Jumpers would perform high altitude drops onto enemy positions using specialized jetpacks and they were considered the most elite non-Jedi unit in the Republic Army for most of its history, renowned for their decisive roles in countless crises. By the time of the Clone Wars, the Rocket Jumpers were a thing of the past, but the 7th Sky Corps represented a sort of revival of the concept, and they lived up to the name of their forebears. The 7th Sky Corps came under command of General Kenobi during the first few months of the Clone Wars. At the time, the unit was not yet led by Commander Cody, who was just a captain at the time and had also yet to choose the name Cody. His promotion to Marshal Commander and overall command of the unit came at Kenobi's suggestion later on. Kenobi's clone liaison at this time was the ARC Trooper Alpha 17, who wasn't attached to any particular unit at the time. It isn't known when exactly Kenobi took command of the 7th Sky Corps, but at the latest, it happened four months into the conflict when Kenobi received a promotion to Jedi Master, the rank of High General, and command of the entire Third Systems Army all at once. This was just prior to the Battle of Munalinst, the 7th Sky Corps' first known engagement in which most of the Third Army participated. The 7th Sky Corps doesn't seem to have had a special role in the Battle of Munalinst, being one of many Third Army units participating in Kenobi's all-out offensive against the strongholds of the intergalactic banking clan. It was the sort of mission that the 7th Sky Corps, the 212th especially, would eventually become renowned for, a highly aggressive, all-out assault in enemy territory. Despite suffering significant casualties, the 3rd Army won the Battle of Munalinst, capturing the IGBC's homeworld for the Republic. After this massive victory, Kenobi received a promotion to the Jedi High Council, filling the seat left empty when Depa Balaba lost her mind in the jungles of Harun Kal. Fresh from their victory at Munalinst, Kenobi and a detachment of the 3rd Army, including parts of the 7th Sky Corps, were next assigned to retake Jabim from the CIS-backed Jabimi nationalists. But if you've heard about Jabim before, you probably know that the battle was a disaster for Republic forces. Early in the battle, General Kenobi and Alpha-17 were presumed killed in action in an attack on the Republic's main base, and the 7th Sky Corps and the rest of the Republic invasion army was absolutely massacred in a vicious 43-day slog. Tens of thousands of clones and dozens of Jedi were killed, with only Anakin Skywalker and a small group of clones escaping Jabim alive. As you could probably guess, Kenobi wasn't actually killed on Jabim and nor was Alpha, they had been captured by Asajj Ventress and spent weeks being tortured before escaping and returning to the Republic. When they did, Alpha-17 left the Third Army behind, returning to Kamino to train clone commanders to think like ARC troopers. Alpha promised to send Kenobi back a new clone liaison who was every bit as competent as he had been and who, per the insistence of Anakin Skywalker, had been given a proper name. Several clone officers from the 7th Sky Corps were recalled to Kamino to be part of Alpha's first class, including Marshal Commander CC2224, the 7th Sky Corps' top officer, who took the name Cody before returning to serve as General Kenobi's new clone commander. Cody's first engagement after graduating from Alpha's class wasn't actually under General Kenobi. In the Battle of Score 2, Cody and the 7th Sky Corps actually served under Mace Windu, protecting the Squib homeworld from Separatist attack. 
Not long after, Cody and the 7th Sky Corps fought under Kenobi in the Battle of Zadja, leading a diversionary assault on a key separate destroyed factory. The battle was won when the factory was destroyed by Jedi sabotage, adding another victory to the 7th Sky Corps record. At Zadja, then Padawan Anakin Skywalker had fought as a commander with the 7th Sky Corps, but shortly after that particular battle, Skywalker was promoted to the ranks of Jedi Knight and General, and he received command of a unit of his own, the 501st Legion. Due to Skywalker and Kenobi's continued friendship and powerful synergy in battle, the 501st Legion and 7th Sky Corps often fought alongside each other, with the 212th Attack Battalion especially joining the 501st in engagements, beginning with the Battle of Christosis. The 212th played a relatively minor part at Christosis, as the 501st and local clone units put in most of the work in liberating the planet from the Confederacy, but Commander Cody had a key role in planning the Republic's strategies during the ground offensives. Shortly after Christosis, the 212th Attack Battalion also participated in the Battle of Teth, in which they rescued what was left of Torrent Company from the armies of Asajj Ventress, and allowed Skywalker and his new Padawan to complete their rescue of Rota the Hutt. Not long after this engagement, a detachment of the 212th also participated in the Battle of Juma 9, in which they helped retake a Republic space station from Separatist-aligned scientist Kul Teska. In early 21 BBY, General Kenobi, Commander Cody, and the 7th Sky Corps participated in two of the war's most significant battles, the Battle for Ryloth and the Second Battle of Geonosis. At Ryloth, the 212th's Ghost Company was one of the first clone units to land as part of the Republic counter-invasion of the planet. The Ghost Company was tasked with destroying a cluster of proton cannons in the village of Nabat that were preventing Republic forces from landing, and once that mission was accomplished, the rest of the 7th Sky Corps descended on Ryloth, liberating several of the planet's cities from Separatist occupation. Cody's men played a major role in the eventual Republic victory on Ryloth, and they played an even bigger one in the Republic victory on Geonosis. In the Second Battle of Geonosis, the 212th Attack Battalion was one of three battalions assigned to secure the main Republic landing zone at Point Rain. However, the initial stages of the invasion went sideways, and Commander Cody and a much reduced detachment of the 212th were the only ones to actually make it to Point Rain as planned. Nonetheless, they were able to defend the site against relentless waves of Genosian and Droid Army troops, holding out until air support cleared the area. The 212th and other units then took out the shield generator protecting Poggle the Lesser's droid factory, allowing the main thrust of the invasion to proceed. The 7th Sky Corps suffered heavy losses in the Second Battle of Geonosis, but it brought the Republic victory in a battle that would have ended in disaster without Cody's leadership. Throughout the remainder of 21 BBY, the 7th Sky Corps made regular appearances on the front lines. In the Battle of Seleucami, not to be confused with the Siege of Seleucami that began a year and a half later, the 212th led a manhunt for General Grievous after the Republic Navy routed his fleet in orbit. A few months later, the 212th also participated in the defense of Kamino alongside the 501st Legion. The 212th, yet again, seemingly didn't play too important a role in that battle, but the same can't be said for the unit's next major engagement, the Battle of Umbara. In the Battle of Umbara, the 7th Sky Corps' first major engagement after the introduction of Phase 2 armor, and the 212th Attack Battalion led the siege of the Umbaran capital as, by this point, the unit had developed a reputation for successful sieges. Several other clone units participated in the assault on the capital, but the 212th and the rest of the 7th Sky Corps led the main thrust. They did so with much less support than they were expecting, as General Ponkrell, who had taken command of the 501st Legion for battle, was deliberately hindering the Republic offensive to curry favour with Count Dooku. The 7th Sky Corps ultimately did most of the heavy lifting in the assault on the Umbaran capital, pressing on despite a lack of support and constant harassment from orbiting Separatist missile cruisers. Their already bad luck was worsened when Krell diverted a platoon from Ghost Company into the 501st's theatre, deliberately causing a gruesome friendly fire incident. Following the revelation of Krell's treachery, troopers from the 212th helped the 501st capture Krell 
and relieve him of command. As they were doing so, the rest of the 7th Sky Corps captured the Onbaran capital and forced the Onbaran government to surrender, winning the battle all but single-handedly. Despite the Republic victory on Onbara, the 7th Sky Corps suffered heavy casualties on the siege, and the same would be true in their next major engagement, the Battle of Sarish. In that battle, the 7th Sky Corps attacked a major separatist stronghold on the Karelian trade spine, only to be chewed up in the early stages of the battle by separatist anti-air guns. Commander Cody and several of his men successfully destroyed the guns, but the Republic suffered such extensive losses that, when the droid army counterattacked, the clones stood little chance. The 7th Sky Corps was routed at Sarish and forced to withdraw. Not long after, the unit would lose many more men in a naval battle with General Grievous, in which the negotiator, General Kenobi's flagship, was captured and destroyed. Throughout 20 BBY, the 7th Sky Corps continued to participate in major engagements, and going forward, most of them were Republic victories. In some, such as the Battle of Rendili, the 7th Sky Corps involvement was minimal, while in others, the unit and its Jedi commander single-handedly turned the tide of entire campaigns. As the year went on, the tide of war steadily began to shift in the Republic's favour, until, in the last month of 20 BBY, the Outer Rim sieges began. As the 7th Sky Corps was renowned by this point for its effectiveness in breaking sieges, it played a major role in the Outer Rim sieges, spending nearly the entire six months of the campaign on the front lines. In the Battle of Bomis Kori IV, it captured and destroyed one of the most heavily fortified separatist strongholds on the Karelian trade spine, and it spent months besieging some of the Confederacy's toughest fortresses on unknown and forgotten rimworlds, often enduring miserable conditions with a dogged refusal to quit. The 7th Sky Corps, together with its Jedi General and his frequent partner, Anakin Skywalker, became renowned as a hammer that could drive the Separatists from any planet, no matter how dug in they were. The 7th Sky Corps only got a break from the Outer Rim when they were called in to fight in the Battle of Catonomoidia, an attack on the Confederacy's last stronghold in the Greater Core. During the battle, the 7th Sky Corps led the charge in the ground assault, with the 212th accompanying Generals Kenobi and Skywalker in the assault on Newt Gunray's private citadel. The 7th Sky Corps captured Katonomoidia, driving Gunray and his aides to the Outer Rim, though intermittent clashes with Separatist holdouts persisted until the end of the war. After taking Katonomoidia, it was back to the Rim for the 7th Sky Corps. Their next engagement was the Battle of Belderone, in which Republic forces successfully defended a recently recaptured Separatist world from General Grievous and his fleet. The 7th Sky Corps also participated in the Battle of Nelvan, helping the Nelvanians drive the Techno Union from their homeworld. It was shortly after the Battle of Nelvan that news reached the men of the 7th Sky Corps that the unthinkable had happened. Coruscant itself was under attack. By the time the 7th Sky Corps returned to Coruscant, the battle on the ground was mostly over, and all that remained was the naval battle happening above the planet, which Republic forces soon won. The 7th remained on Coruscant for a few days following the battle, before they were yet again shipped off to the Outer Rim, this time to Utapal. Republic intelligence had confirmed the presence of General Grievous on Utapal, and the Jedi Council hoped that destroying him would mean the end of the Clone Wars. General Kenobi and the 7th Sky Corps were sent in to do the job. Kenobi went in first and engaged General Grievous, distracting the general while the 7th Sky Corps prepared for an aerial assault on Separatist-held Pal City. The diversion worked, and Cody and his men had the element of surprise when they attacked, quickly capturing the Separatist command center and establishing several beachheads in the city. While Kenobi pursued and eliminated General Grievous, 7th Sky Corps drove his armies from Pal City, utterly routing them in a matter of hours. Before the battle was over, however, Commander Cody had received new orders from Coruscant. Order 66. On his command, the men of the 212th turned on Obi-Wan Kenobi, nearly killing the man who had led them through three years of hell. Cody assumed full command of the 7th Sky Corps, and after driving the Separatists from Utapau, they put Pau City under martial law, assuming direct control until Kenobi was located and eliminated. 
They were still in Utapau the next day when the Galactic Republic was transformed into the Galactic Empire. The Clone Wars finally ended not long after. The Seventh Sky Corps became part of the new Imperial military, and its history after this point is entirely unknown. There's no doubt that war is brutal and that the Clone Wars were no exception to this rule. On this channel, we like to talk about the harsh reality civilians and soldiers alike faced during this contrived conflict to show exactly how much everyone involved was suffering. The clone troopers were no exception. We've talked about how certain units, such as the 327th, got some of the worst assignments of the Clone Wars or how clone battle doctrine was particularly brutal. Today, we're going to look at another clone trooper division that really drew the short straw, the 91st Mobile Reconnaissance Corps, and why we think they had one of the most dangerous jobs in the GAR. As evidenced by their name, the 91st was a division of clone troopers dedicated to reconnaissance. In our universe, reconnaissance involves exploring an area to obtain information about the terrain, enemy forces or formations, and other activities. But some of the most basic mission categories involved reconning a zone, an area, a route, or the strength of an enemy force. Things in the Star Wars universe were no different. This is where the 91st Mobile Reconnaissance Corps came in. As a recon division, it was their job to scout ahead and send back critical info to GR leadership before a large deployment. As a corps, it was made up of roughly 37,000 clone troopers, bark troopers, and aft troopers organized into 16 regiments. Officially, they were led by Jedi General Adi Galea, although other Jedi Generals such as Mace Windu and Stas Ali led the 91st during key missions. The Corps itself was commanded by Clone Marshal Commander Neo. The 91st was easily distinguishable by the red color on their armor as well as their signature crest, which was a small red circle with a white sword pointing upside down through it. They carried standard clone gear and relied heavily on various vehicles, such as ATAPs, ATRTs, and LAATs to transport troopers to the remote locations they had to scout or to support them from the air. And boy, did they need support, both physical and emotional. To give you an idea of some of the Sith they went through, we'll take a look at some of the most important battles we saw the 91st Recon Corps participating in. Around 22 or 21 BBY, the 91st, then led by Commander Pons, were sent with Commander Cody, Mace Windu, and Obi-Wan Kenobi to take out a Separatist warship repair facility called the Tambor Deep Space Center. The 91st took heavy losses during the battle, including the loss of an entire squadron. The 91st were also sent alongside the Jedi to Malastir. During the Battle of Malastir in 21 BBY, an electro-proton bomb they set off unearthed the last Zillow Beast still alive, which proceeded to absolutely maul its way through the clone forces. One of the more well-known battles they were deployed in was the Battle of Ryloth. During the attack on Lesu, the planet's capital city, the 91st's Lightning Squadron were able to swoop in with the Corps ATTEs and rescue Mace Windu's forces, which had been cornered by Separatist assault tanks. The AF troopers were later instrumental in Windu's plan to take the capital. Without them, it's unlikely the Republic would have managed to win the battle. In the later part of the Clone Wars, the 91st continued to see decisive action, some good, some bad. During the Outer Rim sieges, a division of the 91st, again first under Windu, then Stas Ali, traveled to Seleucami, fought in a battle, and remained behind to scout the area and uncover any surviving pockets of Separatist or Morgulkar resistance. This was where Order 66 found them, and, well, that's an entirely different story. Now, we hear you. From everything we've said, that doesn't sound all that bad. But it was, and we'll explain why. See, the thing about reconnaissance missions is that they're both very, very hazardous and very, very unpleasant. As part of their recon missions, the 91st were the first ones on scene in some of the most unpleasant and hostile places in the galaxy. They went in without support, because that's the whole point of recon, and had to navigate entirely unknown swaths of territory, up against unknown numbers and kinds of enemies, with just the hope that they would make it through their route and live long enough to send intelligence back to base. Think of places like Felucia or Umbara, and imagine being sent there all alone into the heart of enemy territory. 
That was the kind of mission the 91st undertook on a regular basis. If the danger wasn't enough to make their jobs a nightmare, you have to factor in the knowledge every clone kept near and dear to his heart. They were replaceable. Much like the B-1 battle droids that were occasionally sent out on recon on STAPs, the 91st knew that they didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. The Grand Army of the Republic had millions of clones at its disposal, and many military commanders viewed the clones as interchangeable pawns on a much more important chessboard. Even many Jedi failed to see the value in clone troopers. We're sure Pong Krell wasn't the exception here. If he were, Jedi such as Plo Koon wouldn't have made such an impression on the various clone trooper divisions. Every single clone trooper in the 91st was disposable, and they felt it. So it wasn't enough that the 91st had to face check all the bushes in the galaxy, but they also did so knowing they weren't going to get any support if they ran into an enemy they couldn't handle. Their job was to go in and gather intel. If they died trying, the Republic wasn't going to shed a tear. And that's just the emotional baggage they had when they landed. After they actually started their mission, Sith only kept hitting the fan. As we mentioned previously, the 91st was sent to some of the most unpleasant places in the galaxy. Reconning terrain meant wading through swamps, sand, dunes, or creepy forests for a living. Sure, they had vehicles to support them, but using them wasn't always an option. There were times where they had to pass through enemy lines or gather intel on enemy fortifications. In those situations, the long-suffering recon troopers likely had to plod forth on foot with all the difficulties that entailed. Another hardship they probably had to endure that many don't think about is the inability to act on what they saw. Undoubtedly, during missions where they were tasked with observing and gathering information, the 91st witnessed more than their fair share of cruelty, whether that was separatist atrocities or just general suffering. However, their mission was observation, not observation and resolution. They were only there to report back with their findings. This meant they weren't technically allowed to intervene and stop whatever horrible thing they had to witness. Doing so would give away the Republic's involvement and put their enemies on their guard. Instead, all the 91st could do was bear silent witness. Add to that the constant fear of being discovered and the full picture of how emotionally draining and traumatic these missions could be begins to emerge. Now we're not saying that the 91st Recon Corps had the hardest job in all of the Grand Army of the Republic. Maybe the Lancer Battalion had it worse, maybe they didn't. Whatever their ranking on the high score of suck, however, there's no doubt that the 91st really, really got a steaming helping of Sith thrown their way at every opportunity. And that's probably why Neo was one of the most depressed and apathetic commanders of the Grand Army of the Republic. At least, that's what we think. It's no secret that we absolutely loathe the Curuson Guard on this channel, and for a variety of reasons. What's less well known is that this opinion was fairly common within the Star Wars universe as well, especially on Curuson. Most people hated the Curuson Guard, and the Curuson Guard hated most people too. The shock troopers charged with protecting the galactic capital detested their jobs, especially when those jobs involved dealing with senators or the inhabitants of Galactic City. We don't really blame them either. The Curuson Guard had some of the nastiest jobs in the Grand Army of the Republic, and in this video we're going to talk all about them. The Curuson Guard was formed right after the First Battle of Geonosis, and was an elite force of clone shock troopers tasked with, well, guarding Curuson. Their duties included protecting senators, defending Galactic City, and managing Republic military installations on Curuson, all of which sound a lot easier than they actually were. Only Palpatine's most loyal clones were allowed to serve in the Curuson Guard, ostensibly to ensure that Curuson was as well protected as possible. In reality, however, the Curuson Guard was stacked with fervent supporters of Palpatine because the Guard also did a lot of the Chancellor's dirty work. Over the course of the Clone Wars, the Curuson Guard became the foundation of what would become the Imperial Police State. They were brutally repressive, and the population of Galactic City quickly came to fear the boys in red, nicknaming them Stormtroopers. For what it's worth, Clone Shock Troopers didn't like their jobs any more than the people they terrorized. 
Though, obviously, their willing involvement means that we don't exactly feel sorry for them. After all, these are the guys that killed Fives, and we're not going to start being sympathetic just because they sometimes felt bad after beating the frack out of innocent civilians. They probably deserved the unpleasant parts of their job. So, what were the unpleasant parts of their jobs? Well, firstly, there was dealing with senators. The Coruscant Guard was tasked with protecting the Galactic Senate, in conjunction with the Senate Commandos. And through the Diplomatic Escort Group, they were also assigned to protect Senators and other Republic delegates when they travelled off-world. Obviously, this was a very important task, since Senators were always at risk of assassination, especially during the Clone Wars. But providing protection from Assassins wasn't the hard part of the job. The hard part of the job was trying not to kill the Senators themselves. Observation. Senators are not nice, Master. They are either on top of the game or yesterday's news. I'm As Paul Fives learned, killing was something the Coruscant Guard had a really hard time with on its own, but Senators made it even harder. They tended to be whiny, paranoid, treacherous, or some combination therein, and almost all of them acted privileged beyond their due, and out of touch in some way or another. Even worse, shock troopers on senatorial guard duty could have had the misfortune of being assigned to Jar Jar Binks, a fate worse than death. Protecting a person of interest who's extraordinarily annoying would make anyone want to swallow their blaster. To make matters worse, shock troopers constantly had to watch their charges for hints of treachery, due to the nature of the Clone Wars, which was an even bigger pain. But the worst part of it all, was that the Senators didn't appreciate it at all. Most Senators had gotten used to having servants and bodyguards around them at all times, and they usually disregarded them unless they had a problem. While the Shock Troopers were probably happy to avoid more interaction with Senators than they had to have, it also meant that they were often ignored, and protected their political valuable charges thanklessly. In fact, many Senators outright resented the Coruscant Guard's security measures, after the passage of the Enhanced Security and Enforcement Act in 21 BBY, the Coruscant Guard set up checkpoints all across Galactic City, where shock troopers would ask passers-by to present identification. Senators had an annoying habit of expecting special treatment from the guards at these checkpoints, and of making a fuss when they didn't get it. Even in the Star Wars universe, it seems politicians are politicians. Additionally, most shock troopers assigned to protect senators likely had to coordinate with the senator's own security detail, which would have been a nightmare. This would have been a hell of a job even if the senators themselves weren't all that bad. I mean, imagine being a shock trooper assigned to protect Senator Amidala, only to realize that all of her handmaidens look pretty much identical. It would get even worse if were you later to learn that the Senator and one of the Handmaidens swapped outfits mid-flight and that you don't know who the frack you're protecting anymore. Lots of Senators had those sorts of crazy protection schemes, and for the Coruscant Guard, they would have been just another thing to get in the way of their jobs. This fostered a general hatred for Senators that, it should be said, wasn't exclusive to the Coruscant Guard. Pretty much everyone hated Senators, but clones in general hated them more than most, and for good reason. After all, it was the Senators who decided to keep every last one of them enslaved, and you could imagine that that rubbed a few clones the wrong way. Moreover, most clones detested the Senate in general, seeing it as useless and inefficient. Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, most clones believed, was the only one who made the Senate worth fighting for. The Coruscant Guard was also responsible for maintaining all Republic military facilities on Coruscant, including military bases and, unfortunately for the clones, the Republic Judiciary Central Detention Center. A fair few clone troopers ended up serving as glorified prison guards in two facilities, Coruscant's main military base and the Republic's central prison. Now, being a prison guard is another job that really just sucks on its own. But the types of prisoners incarcerated on Coruscant made the whole thing a lot worse. The Central Detention Center was home to galactic-scale criminals, including spice kingpins, underworld leaders, and elite bounty hunters. The prison at the military base wasn't much better, as it mostly contained war criminals. These were dangerous beings who were constantly trying to escape prison, 
and they were typically powerful enough to be able to bring in elite mercenaries or even separatist military units to do the job. The Coruscant Guard had to be constantly wary about prisoner escape attempts or even raids on the detention facilities. With that said, as we've been saying, a lot of that was honestly deserved considering the other usual activities of the Coruscant Guard. So let's take a look at what they did that made them positively awful. The Coruscant Guard was technically a subset of Homeworld Security Command, a hybrid police slash military department. As part of Homeworld Security, the Coruscant Guard worked with Galactic City Police to combat the threat of separatist violence on the Galactic Capital. This threat was very real, in fairness. In the two years before the Clone Wars, Coruscant had been subjected to a long string of terrorist bombings committed in the name of Count Dooku, which is what led to the formation of Homeworld Security in the first place. The Coruscant Guard, to their credit, did significantly decrease the number of terrorist attacks on Coruscant over the course of the Clone Wars, but this came at quite a high cost. Homeworld Security was quite paranoid, and it rarely made any distinction between simple dissent and separatism. From the first days of the Clone Wars, it dispatched the Coruscant Guard against protesters, authorizing the use of force even when, in hindsight, it wasn't justified at all. Clone shock troopers brutally dispersed anti-war protests whenever they popped up, as well as more mundane protest movements. For example, when the war began, the Republic military leveled several city blocks to make way for military staging areas, displacing thousands of residents. These residents had nowhere else to go and protested lawfully outside the construction area, hoping to gain some form of reimbursement for their homes. Instead, they got beaten by shock troopers and deported. Not all demonstrations on Coruscant were met with violence from the Coruscant Guard, however. When Loyalist Nationalists founded the Commission for the Protection of the Republic in 21 BBY, the Coruscant Guard was actually deployed to protect their rallies, despite the fact that Compor was a private organization unaffiliated with the Republic government. This was also despite the fact that Compor seemingly only accepted human applicants and promoted violent anti-alien conspiracy theories. As the Clone Wars went on, the Coruscant Guard started focusing less on stopping threats to planetary security and more on what they considered preventing threats to planetary security. After the passage of the Enhanced Security and Enforcement Act, they got the go-ahead to throw any and all civil liberties to the wind, and you can imagine the results. Coruscant's lower levels were placed under curfews and quarantines, and warrantless surprise raids on lower city homes became commonplace. The Coruscant Guard became Palpatine's secret police, terrorizing the population of Galactic City indiscriminately to keep Coruscant's underclass in check. The Coruscant Guard was nothing short of viciously oppressive. They were the Empire before there was an Empire, Stormtroopers before there were Stormtroopers. There's no denying that their jobs sucked, and that most of the clones who served in the Guard probably hated their lives. But if your life is spent beating up random aliens in their own homes for no reason, then you honestly should hate your life. The Coruscant Guard didn't just have Five's bloods on its hands. After all, there were thousands, if not millions, of beings who suffered unjustly because of them. Despite being one of the more well-known clone units among fans of the Clone Wars era, the 41st Elite Corps is often poorly understood. Those who are familiar with the Corps would likely remember it for the green markings its troopers wore on their armor, and for their friendliness with non-human allies of the Republic. But none of that is entirely true. Most of the 41st actually weren't all that keen on aliens. They painted their standard armor with grey stripes for half of the war, and they weren't even a real Corps. Evidently, there's much more to this unit than most fans know, so in this video, We'll be doing a deep dive into what the 41st was actually like. Despite its name, the 41st Elite Corps was actually a brigade, also known as a legion, composed of four regiments for a total of 9,216 clone troopers. Why it was named a corps when it wasn't is beyond us. The 41st was a component unit of the larger 9th Assault Corps, itself a part of the 3rd Sector Army. 
The 9th Assault Corps itself was legendary, known as one of the most effective units in Steel Blade Command, with many of the 9th Assault Corps component units specializing in the application of overwhelming force. The 41st Elite Corps though was a bit more subtle. There were a bunch of noteworthy subunits within the 41st Elite itself. Two of its more notable battalions were Sarlacc Battalions A and B, which seemed to be standard ground assault units, while in canon there was also the 41st Scout Battalion, a unit of clone scout troopers which in turn contained Red Company and the 41st Ranger Platoon. There was also Green Company, which appeared in Star Wars The Clone Wars, another standard unit whose members painted their armor with, you guessed it, green stripes. All of the clones within the 41st were considered elite in some fashion, either due to above average simulation scores on Kamino or specialized training. Many clones in the 41st were AF troopers, clone scout troopers, or sharpshooters, and as such, they employed specialized armor similar to that of Imperial scout troopers, which provided added mobility and featured additional sensors built into their helmet. While on worlds like Kashyyyk, Ordinary members of the 41st Elite sometimes wore scout trooper armor, which was often painted with camouflage. When they weren't wearing camouflage armor, most members of the 41st Elite Corps wore armor with light gray stripes, as can be seen on Coruscant in Revenge of the Sith. There were exceptions to this rule, however, as some companies chose to paint their armor with green stripes, most notably Green Company. The 41st Elite Corps also had a pretty impressive arsenal of armored vehicles. For recon purposes and combat in densely forested regions, they made use of bark speeders, ISPs, and ATRTs, typically piloted by specialized bark troopers and ATRT drivers. For open warfare, they preferred ATAPs, ATTEs, and HAVW A6 juggernauts, three heavy vehicles with exceptional forward firepower suggesting that the 41st was much more aggressive on open battlefields than it usually was. Typically, they would use their ATAPs for long-range artillery fire and their juggernauts as their main heavy tanks, as exemplified by the Battle of Kashyyyk, where they used such tactics to defend Kachiro Beach. The 41st Elite Corps was commanded by Senior Clone Commander CC1004, who usually went by the name Gri. Other officers within the 41st included Green Leader, who was an officer within Green Company, and Commander Get, whom we'll talk about a bit more later. Commander Green and the other clone officers within the 41st typically worked under Senior General Luminara Unduli, the Jedi General of the Third Sector Army, though they often worked with Grand Master Yoda. The 41st Elite Corps was regularly deployed on long missions to remote, undeveloped worlds typically to work alongside or otherwise recruit non-human allies of the Republic. Like the 327th Star Corps, the 41st Elite gained a reputation for being good at protracted warfare in hostile environments, with their scout units being second to none in the entire Grand Army of the Republic. But they were best known for their other speciality. They were good at motivating the alien populations of those worlds to fight for the Republic. During the early stages of the Clone Wars, the Grand Army of the Republic was stretched thin across the galaxy, and to compensate for their manpower shortage, Republic strategists came up with the militia model. The concept was simple. Instead of deploying whole clone armies to defend far-flung Republic member worlds, a small company of clones would be sent in to train and arm loyalist militias and let them do the bulk of the fighting. This strategy worked fairly well for the Republic, with notable instances of it including the Battle of Harun Kal and the Battle of Giju. The 41st Elite Corps specialized in the militia model. This was in no small part thanks to Commander Gri, who was a xenoanthropology nerd and loved learning about obscure alien languages and cultures. This allowed the 41st Elite to make contact with the indigenous populations of strategically important worlds and convince them to fight for the Republic. Often, the 41st made loyalist armies out of pre-agricultural populations the separatists had written off as inconsequential primitives, training them in conventional tactics and arming them with advanced weaponry. The 41st didn't just work with alien populations that were already loyalist, either. Oftentimes, 
they swayed neutral populations to the Republic side, and sometimes they did so on separatist dominated worlds. That was the other side of the militia model. It wasn't just used to defend loyalist worlds from separatist incursions. The 41st's job description included counterinsurgency and regime change, the latter of which is a particularly unethical thing, especially considering the nature of the Clone Wars. Over the course of the Clone Wars, the 41st Elite Corps saw a great many battles. During the early war, Green Company captured Newt Gunray on Rhodia and unsuccessfully attempted to defend the Star Destroyer Tranquility against the Sarge Ventress's subsequent rescue attempt. The battle on the Tranquility inflicted substantial casualties on Green Company, but the unit recovered enough to participate in the Second Battle of Geonosis a few months later. On Geonosis, Green Company assisted the 501st Legion in the assault on Poggle the Lesser's droid factory, filling in for the depleted 212th Attack Battalion. Once the droid factory was destroyed, Green Company and the rest of the 41st participated in mop-up efforts across Geonosis. Other notable engagements included the Battle of Dinlo, which didn't go nearly as well as Geonosis, and the Battle of Kashyyyk, the 41st's most well-known outing. On Kashyyyk, the 41st worked with the native Wookiees and Grandmaster Yoda to defend the city of Kachiro from the armies of General Grievous. They were successful, but during the battle, Order 66 was issued. Commander Fei of another unit executed General Unjuli, while Commander Gree died trying to execute Yoda himself. Yoda escaped Kashyyyk not long before the 41st turned around and occupied Kashyyyk in the name of the newly declared Galactic Empire. After the rise of the Empire, the 41st Elite Corps was renamed to the 41st Stormtrooper Legion, and they went from working alongside alien species on the Republic's fringe to violently suppressing them. But this was less of a heel turn than it was a mask off moment for the 41st Elite. You see, for all they worked with no human species, the 41st Elite weren't exactly the most enlightened men in the galaxy. Even Commander Gree, despite being an alien enthusiast, seemed to have looked down on non-human species. According to Commander Get, just before the Battle of Kashyyyk, Gree described the Wookiees to the men of the 501st as a race of savages surrounded by slavers and worse monsters, yet tamed by the influence of civilization. This abominable rhetoric paints a more accurate picture of the 41st. They weren't friends of the Republic's loyal allies, but supremacists who looked down on the very peoples they were recruiting to fight the Confederacy. Get himself was a fan of the writings of a certain Moff Tarkin, a brutal humanocentrist, and he cited Commander Gree as the one who introduced him to Tarkin's work. The 41st saw the species they were recruiting through a disgustingly colonial lens, viewing the alien species of the galaxy as wayward primitives who needed the guidance and rule of the Republic. It's abhorrent in the highest degree, and it shows that even before the end of the Clone Wars, the Republic was fast becoming an empire. The Grand Army of the Republic was massive, containing innumerable subdivisions, many of which were notable for various reasons. We've talked extensively about some of the most well-known clone units in the past, such as the 501st Legion, the 212th Attack Battalion, and so on. But today, we're going to be doing something a little different. In this video, we're going to be giving some attention to all of the less remarkable named clone units from both Legends and Canon, from large cores to small special forces units. Before we begin, we should first establish that this isn't an exhaustive list of all clone units. We won't be covering any unit that we've already given a video, as well as any subdivisions of said units. The 332nd Division, for example, was a part of the 501st Legion, so it won't be discussed. In addition, we're only going to be discussing units that have both a name and something worth talking about, which rules out unidentified units and units that were named but never discussed in any detail. With all that out of the way, let's begin, starting with the largest units. First off, we have two lesser known cores, the 416th Star Corps and the 87th Sentinel Corps. The 416th was commanded by Jedi Master Kakruk early in the Clone Wars, and it had the distinction of being one of the first clone units to ever see action. One of its officers, Regimental Commander CRC09-571, served under Yoda himself on Geonosis, 
in which the rest of the 416th presumably participated. This veteran unit didn't last all that long however. Just three months after Geonosis, the 416th was massacred in the Battle of Tyre, in which it suffered casualties so staggeringly high that Kukruk deserted the Grand Army and considered leaving the Jedi Order to escape the war. Next up is the 87th Sentinel Corps, one of a few clone units that's only known for its appearance in EA's Star Wars Battlefront 2. Members of the Sentinel Corps wore armor with maroon markings and specialized in urban warfare, skills they employed in a battle on Naboo during the later stages of the war. The pattern of their armor stripes was very similar to that of another Battlefront exclusive unit, the 181st Armored Division, which wore green striped armor and fought in the Battle of Kashyyyk. They specialized in vehicle heavy assaults in hostile environments, often making use of juggernaut tanks and ATRTs in combat. Scaling down a little, we have two legions to discuss. The first is the 187th Legion, which you might know as Mace Windu's elite unit. These clones had purple stripes on their armor in a pattern similar to that of the Coruscant Guard in honor of Windu's purple blade. These guys fought with Windu in the Battle of Dantooine early in the war and in the Battle of Coruscant near its end. In the latter engagement, the 187th fought to protect the Jedi Temple. These guys have the interesting quirk of being part of both Legends and Canon, despite only ever having appeared as toys. In Legends, they were brought into the continuity by promotional material for Hasbro action figures, while in Canon, they were brought into the continuity by LEGO, which released a set based on the 187th a few years back. Next up, we have the 182nd Legion, which has the dubious distinction of being known primarily for getting slaughtered. These guys had red armor markings and their first known appearance was in a mission to Belgaroth early in the war, in which they lost all but one of the men deployed to the planet. The rest of the unit met with a similar fate during the Outer Rim sieges, when the entire 182nd Legion was wiped out in the early stages of the Battle of Felucia, caught between the droid army and hordes of starved Akleys. Now let's talk about some of the smaller units, the battalions and companies, starting with the 13th Battalion. These guys wore armor with mustard yellow paint stripes, a color scheme they shared with a separate unit, implying that the pattern was shared across a larger division. If these clones look familiar, that's because they served under Jedi Master Jaro Tapal, the master of Cal Kestis from Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. After a heated battle on Bracca, these clones attempted to kill Tapal and Kestis after the execution of Order 66 aboard the Star Destroyer Albedo Brave. The wounded master Tapal destroyed the Star Destroyer to cover Kestis' escape, wiping out the 13th Battalion entirely. The 442nd Siege Battalion was a unit that specialized in, you guessed it, sieges. They wore armor with lime markings and preferred to move quickly and efficiently favoring ATRTs and ISPs for armored support. They fought in the Battle of Cato Nomoria during the final stages of the Clone Wars, but little else is known about them. A similar, lesser known unit is the 187th Battalion, a unit of clones that served under Mace Windu. These guys were separate from the 187th Legion and wore armor with maroon stripes. Their specialities are entirely unknown, but they fought in the Battle of Anaxis late in the war. Our last lesser known small unit is Horn Company, which was briefly seen in Star Wars The Clone Wars. They wore armor with bright lime stripes and served under Jedi Master Eeth Koth, acting as security aboard his flagship, the Star Destroyer, Steadfast. Little is known about them, but they've got a cool armor pattern, so we determined that made them worth a mention. The company was led by Captain CC4142, nicknamed Locke, and it suffered heavy casualties when the Steadfast was boarded by General Grievous in 21 BBY. More than half of the company was slaughtered by Grievous's commando droids, and the rest were ordered to abandon ship by General Koth. They never appeared again. There were a few lesser known clone units with special duties, acting as special forces or in specific niche combat roles, and we've saved those for last. The first of these was Rancor Battalion, a unit of elite clones assigned to defend Kamino in 21 BBY. This battalion was commanded by ARC Troopers, with ARC Commanders Blitz and Havoc as Staff Officers and Commander Colt as their CO. Much of the unit was composed of specially trained ARF Troopers and, by and large, the Rancor Battalion was considered one of the most well-trained units in the GAR. Nonetheless, 
They sustained heavy casualties in the Battle of Camino, including Commander Colt, who was killed by Asajj Ventress. The 44th Special Operations Division was another elite unit, and it had the misfortune of being commanded by Kendall Ozzel, the future Imperial Admiral that you might know for flubbing the beginning of the Battle of Hoth and being killed for it by Darth Vader. Most of what we know about the 44th comes from a single subdivision of it, the Devil Dogs, a team of elite clones known for blowing stuff up wherever they went. Led by Captain Sharp, these guys fought in the Battle of Korm, which they played a major role in winning for the Republic, albeit at the cost of the lives of Captain Sharp and many of his men. Possibly the worst unit of the entire GAR to serve in was the Lancer Battalion, which we've mentioned before, but is silly enough to merit further mention here. The Lancer Battalion was a unit of clone troopers trained for a single purpose, to participate in jousts on the battlefield. Riding Aratech 105K Lancer bikes and carrying Verpine power lancers, their job was usually to distract the enemy by charging in and turning anything that got in their way into a shish kebab. The casualty rate for the Lancer Battalion was quite high, as you might expect for a battalion that didn't use guns, and their only known appearance was in the Battle of Munilinst, in which they participated in an actual joust against Dirge's Lancer droids under the command of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Kenobi and Dirge were the only known survivors of the clash, so the Lancer Battalion may actually have been wiped out on Munilinst. Lastly, we have 5th Fleet Security, a unit of clone troopers that served exclusively aboard ships of the Republic Navy, acting as marines in the case of boarding actions. These guys had mostly plain white armor, with only a few thin blue stripes to distinguish them from ordinary clones, and their role was pretty much exactly what you would guess from the name. It's unknown what unit in the Republic Navy 5th Fleet Security was attached to, unless it was the 5th Fleet, of course, if there even was a 5th Fleet, and it's unknown what battles they participated in. Nonetheless, it's interesting that the GAR assigned units to defend the Republic's warships, as opposed to the Navy having its own security branch. One of the best Star Wars games of all time, after the Knights of the Old Republic games of course, was Star Wars Republic Commando. From the unique artistic style to the Mandalorian themed soundtrack to the gritty tone and presentation, there's so much that makes this game distinctly awesome. An essential part of the experience is being put in the boots of a clone commando, an elite badass in charge of a squad of four. The experience is thrilling enough that ever since the game's release, Clone Commandos have had a thriving base of dedicated fans, which has resulted in lots of Commando lore. In this video, we'll be laying out every last scrap of said Commando lore, analyzing the Republic's elite units in detail. You have been born into dangerous times. A sharp mind can be the key to survival. But as often as not, it will be your inherent physical traits that win the day. And in this regard, you will be superior to your more common brethren. For you are a commander, an elite unit, something truly special. During the early stages of the Kaminoans clone army project, Django Fett raised concerns that the modified, behaviorally conditioned rank and file clone troopers would be unable to complete special operations missions that required a greater degree of independence and creativity. On his urging, the Kaminoans created the ARC troopers who lacked behavioral conditioning and had personalities that were pretty much identical to Django's. But the first batch of ARC troopers, the Null class, was a failure and the Kaminoans had very little faith in the Alpha class, their replacements. They allowed Django to train his ARC troopers but they nonetheless set out to create their own batch of commandos which they hoped would be more reliable. These commandos were envisioned as striking a balance between the hyper-independent ARCs and the orders-driven regular troopers. They were allowed a greater degree of creativity and independent thought than the regs, but they were trained to be more loyal and committed to following orders than the ARCs. 
As with the Regs, they were indoctrinated with absolute loyalty to the Republic, which the Kaminoans hoped would make them more predictable and easier to control than the Ark Troopers. Furthermore, much as they allowed Django to train the Ark Troopers personally, they allowed outsiders to handle the training of clone commandos as well. During the early days of the clone commando program, Django Fett recruited 100 elite mercenaries to train the commandos. 75 of them were Mandalorians, while many of the remainder were Corellians, but all were the best in their field. Fett and the Kaminoans promised them all extraordinary rewards and a place in history, and in exchange, these trainers would not be allowed to leave Kamino until the secret army had been deployed. As befitting these harsh conditions, the recruiters became known as the Koivalda, a Mandoa word meaning those who no longer exist. After a while, most were believed dead by their families and friends. Each trainer was assigned a company of 104 clone commandos to train out of the 10,400 total clone commandos, and for the next 10 years, they each trained their batches in their own unique ways. Taking inspiration from the Kaminoan Iowa, which hunted in pods to bring down larger prey, the Kaminoans had each commando raised as part of a squad of four. Commandos were trained to see their squad mates as their brothers and themselves as pieces of a whole person. Thus, commando squads became incredibly tight-knit. Under the guidance of the Koival Da, they also became extremely skilled. Their training was beyond brutal. Some commandos were killed during live fire training exercises, and all commandos were subjected to brutal torture to prepare them to resist interrogation. Clone commandos were not only experts in a plethora of combat techniques, but also in infiltration, assassination, demolition, emergency medical care, and much more. They were elite in the fullest sense of the word. Nonetheless, their skill sets weren't the same as those of ordinary troopers. They didn't perform well as part of a larger army, nor on open battlefields. As commandos, they were trained to work independently, and they tended to disappoint when their commanders expected them to work the same way as the regs. But they were highly effective when their skills were used properly. But the clone commandos weren't just incredibly skilled. They were well equipped as well. Unlike ARC troopers, who used slightly modified regular clone armor, Clone Commandos used Advanced Katan class armor, which was a marked improvement over the standard kit. The black body glove over which the suit was assembled was tougher, and the armor itself was thicker, made of blast-resistant duraplast, capable of shielding the wearer from extreme heat and cold, and it featured a multitude of sensors for optimal performance. Like the standard clone kit, it was composed of 20 pieces, a flexible placard, boots, and a helmet. The boots were rated for all manner of terrain, and the knuckle plate featured a hidden vibra blade for close encounters. All told, the kit weighed 20 kilograms, and it was worth 100,000 credits on the black market. It came in three versions. These were the Katan Mark I, released at the start of the war, the Katan Mark II, which provided additional protection against EMP weapons and Verpine shatter guns, and the Katan Mark III, which was almost completely blast resistant and could protect the wearer against grenades. The helmet of the Katan suit featured full communication systems, an air filter, a heads up display in the visor, a night vision mode, built in electro binoculars, and a tactical spot lamp. Members of the squad synchronized their helmets, allowing their HUDs to display each other's vitals, enabling commandos to be able to tell when one of their brethren needed help. Like with standard clone helmets, the HUDs of Katan class helmets interfaced with the targeting systems of standard issue blasters, but Katan helmets had the unique ability to independently analyze and calculate targeting information for non-standard weapons, allowing it to generate specialized targeting reticules. The Katan class kit came with a heavy duty survival pack, which was heavily customizable but generally contained plenty of spare armor, explosives, emergency medical supplies, provisions and survival gear, an oxygen tank for operations in a vacuum, and even a portable communications array. It also contained a personal shield generator, which generated deflector shields that allowed commandos to take a few hits before they started suffering injuries. The clone commando kit also contained a vast arsenal of weapons. Their primary weapon was the DC-17M interchangeable weapons system, a versatile weapon that could function as a rapid firing blaster rifle, 
a sniper rifle, and an anti-armor grenade launcher. Commandos also carried DC-15S blaster pistols as sidearms. These weren't nearly as impressive, but they had a recharging power cell that meant they never ran out of ammo, making them a useful last resort. Many commandos preferred non-standard weapons over the DC-17M and DC-15S, however. Alternative primary weapons used by clone commandos included, but weren't limited to, Verpine shatter guns, Trenocean ACP array guns and repeaters, shotguns of various models, LG-50 concussion rifles, Vibro daggers, Ocean force pikes, DC-17 hand blasters, Westar-20 blaster pistols, LS-50 heavy ACP repeaters, and Kamino and saber darts. On top of all that, clone commandos used lots of explosives. Grenades used by commandos included standard frag and EMP rounds, ion grenades, stun grenades, flashbangs, sonic detonators, and thermal detonators, while for high yield explosives, commandos used standard det packs, bore bangs, AP micro mines, and ribbon charges. All told, clone commandos were armed to the teeth at all times. As with the ARC troopers, clone commandos' experiences during training not only shaped their performance, but their personalities as well. Each Koivaldar trainer had their own unique approach. Kal Skarada and Rav Bralor saw their trainees as their sons and treated them as such, encouraging them and making clear they cared about their commandos, though they still subjected them to harsh training. Some, most notably Wallon Val, were particularly brutal, with their aim being to make their commandos instinctual survivors. Many of Val's commandos hated him because of how brutal he was, but his training paid off. Commandos who trained under him had a much higher rate of survival than the others. Additionally, the Koivaldar instilled the clone commandos with a sense of culture and community, believing it important to give soldiers something bigger and more personal to be part of. As most of the Koivaldar were Mandalorian, this meant that most clone commandos were raised as Mandalorians, taught to speak Mandoa as a second language, and raised with Mandalorian values. A lot of regular clones disliked clone commandos for this, especially after the Mandalorian protectors joined the Separatists and started killing clones in large numbers. We tend to agree that the Mandabu commandos were cringe, at the very least, especially since indoctrination into a culture that glorified their trauma and slavery as badass warrior heroics was the last thing any clone needed, but oh well. Not all commandos were Mandaboos, of course. Those trained under the Corellian trainers adopted Corellian cultural traits instead, for example. But regardless, clone commandos were a breed apart, both from the regs and the arcs. Commanders tended to see the arcs a bit like the Kaminoans did, as unstable and overrated, while they looked down on regular clones for not being as tough or independent. These animosities were mutual, and they weren't helped by the fact that the commandos were the Kaminoans' clear favorites. Like arc troopers, clone commandos weren't part of the regular Grand Army of the Republic. Instead, they composed the bulk of the Republic Special Operations Brigade, which had its own commando structure. The basic unit was a squad of four commandos, including and led by a sergeant. Five squads made up a troop, which was typically commanded by a Jedi commander, and five troops made a company, which was typically led by a designated commando commander. Five companies made a commando group, which was placed under the leadership of a Jedi general. There were 10 commando groups in the Spec Ops Brigade, which was commanded by Jedi General Arligan Zay. If you were paying special attention just now, you might notice that that would only be 5,000 commandos, just half of the original number of clone commandos. That would be because half of all clone commandos died in the first Battle of Geonosis, for reasons we'll discuss in a bit. For now though, let's talk about all the known squads and the commandos that comprise them. There are a bunch that were wiped out or nearly wiped out, many of them on Genosis and were subsequently dissolved, with their surviving members reassigned to new squads. Some squads, as we'll discuss later, were entirely composed of sole survivors. These were known as mongrel squads by other commandos, as they tended to lack the same level of brotherly connection ordinary commando squads had. Nearly two entire squads were wiped out in one early mission to Ord Mantell, with only one commando, RC-1013, surviving. RC-1013, or Sarge, was later assigned to be the leader of Iowa Squad. The rest of this squad consisted of RC-2088, or Zag, 
and the commandos Taito and Dikut. That last commando's nickname is Mandawa for Damas, by the way, and we'd absolutely love to know the story of how he earned that nickname. Anyway, Iowa squad seemingly had much better luck than Sarge's original squad and it held together to the end of the Clone Wars when it fought under General Travis in the Battle of Garki, following which the members of Iowa squad killed Travis in compliance with Order 66. Of the squads that were nearly wiped out on Geonosis, one, the original squad led by RC-1309, or Niner, suffered a fatality before the war even began. Commando RC-8028, or 28, was killed in an explosives accident during training on Kamino. The rest of his squad consisted of RC-1304, or 04, and two other commandos nicknamed Sev and DD, one of whom was 28's replacement. All of these commandos, except Niner, were killed on the first day of the Clone Wars. Niner wasn't the only clone commando to be the sole survivor from his original squad. RC-3222, or Aiton, was originally a member of Prudai's squad, but he also lost all his brothers on Geonosis. The next squad he was assigned to was wiped out as well, leaving him as the sole survivor of two squads in a row. Terok's squad and Theta squad were both also all but wiped out on Geonosis, leaving behind only RC-8015 or Phi and RC-1136 or Darman. Three months into the war, Niner, Aiton, Phi and Darman were all grouped together under the banner of Omega Squad. You might remember these guys being the main characters of the Republic Commando novels. Known for their spooky Black Knight Ops armor and their unusual set of skills, the Commandos of Omega Squad had plenty of adventures during the Clone Wars. They were responsible for infiltration missions on Kalura, Fest, Olanet, and Gaftika, counter-terrorism operations on Coruscant and elsewhere, and one member of the squad, Darman, was responsible for getting a Jedi Padawan pregnant. During the war, Fai suffered a severe brain injury that left him disabled for the rest of his life, and he was replaced in Omega Squad by RC-5108-8843, or Kor. Kor was an interesting character in his own right. He was originally a regular clone and lost both his forearms to an explosive, forcing him to get droid arms as prosthetics, which he liked to use to sharpen knives. Omega Squad was part of Arca Company within 05 Commando Battalion. Other squads in Arca Company included Veshok Squad and the infamous Delta Squad, the members of which were widely considered the best clone commandos in the whole army. Delta Squad was composed of RC-1138 or Boss, RC-1140 or Fixer, RC-1207 or Sev, and RC-1262 or Scorch. None of these men need an introduction being the main characters of Star Wars Republic Commando. Delta Squad was one of the few squads not to lose a single member on Genosis, and indeed, they didn't lose anyone until the last days of the war, when Sev went MIA on Kashyyyk. Some of the other squads that weren't so lucky included Iowa 3 Squad, not to be confused with the ordinary Iowa Squad, which lost everyone except the Commando Jez on Genosis. The same was true for Bravo Squad, which lost everyone except for the Commando Ram, and Gamma Squad, which lost everyone except the Commando Stoker. Gamma Squad was rebuilt with new members, but the fates of the others are unknown. There was also Foxtrot Group, a larger unit led by Clone Commando Captain RC5576-39, also known as Gregor, which was almost completely destroyed in the Battle of Sarish. Some of the more obscure Commando squads included Kilo Squad, one of the first deployed, of which next to nothing is known. Nast, Vevut, and Aura squads, which were composed almost entirely of Rav Bradle's trainees, and Orek, Akila, Yayax, and Manka squads, all of which were only mentioned in passing. There was also Ion Team, which participated in the Battle of Mercana at the end of the war, and was only really notable for refusing to execute Order 66, saving the lives of Jedi Generals Rowan Shrine, Bolch Attack, and Padawan Oli Starstone. There were also a few Clone Commando squads with rather unique circumstances and specialities. One was the High Orbit Precision Entry Unit, or HOPE Squad, which specialized in deploying onto planets via orbital drop pods, ODST star. There was also Tark Squad, which was notable for not being composed of Jango Fett clones at all. How the hell this unit came to be is unknown, but it consisted of Thrissian mercenaries trained by Sarius Torn, 
a member of the Thrissian Sun Guard. Tark's squad participated in the Battle of Sky alongside Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Lastly, Kanan had introduced us to the Bad Batch, a member of mutated clone commandos with their own unique skills and personalities. We've talked extensively about them in the past, so we won't reiterate here. Clone Commandos saw action all throughout the Clone Wars, and we've discussed many of these missions already. But a discussion about Clone Commandos would be incomplete without discussion of the first Battle of Geonosis, in which all 10,000 of the original Clone Commandos were deployed. And nearly half of them died. This staggering casualty rate was largely the fault of Jedi Generals deploying Clone Commandos alongside units of ordinary Clone Troopers as elite soldiers, a job the Commandos were neither trained nor suited for. Some were used as actual commandos, like Delta Squad, but many were not, and many died for it. After this disaster, the Jedi eventually figured out how to command units of clone commandos, though many commandos never forgave the Jedi for Geonosis all the same. Throughout the Clone Wars, commandos played an essential role on innumerable battlefronts, altering the tides of the entire war with sabotage operations and counter-terrorism ops on Coruscant. Over the course of the conflict, some commandos, notably those of Omega Squad, began to question the war and their place in it. Dislike for the Jedi blossomed into distrust of the Republic, and some commandos even deserted the GAR, with some faking their deaths to do so. Nonetheless, most commandos remained loyal soldiers of the Republic. At the end of the Clone Wars, some commandos participated in the execution of Order 66, while others refused to carry out the order. Some commandos, such as the members of Delta Squad, went on to serve the Empire, some as Stormtrooper trainers and others just as commandos. Under the Empire, the remaining clone commandos were rolled into the 501st Legion and almost exclusively deployed to hunt surviving Jedi, dissidents and Jedi sympathizers alongside Lord Vader. However, many commandos refused to serve the Empire and deserted after the end of the war, including members of Omega Squad. Ever since the 2003 Clone Wars micro-series, ARC Troopers have gripped the imaginations of Clone Wars fans. From their dramatic introduction in the Star Wars Republic comics and Clone Wars comics to their regular appearances in Star Wars The Clone Wars, the Republic's advanced recon commandos have been unfailingly badass. And if these appearances have left you wanting to learn more about ARC Troopers, fear not, that's what we're here for. In this video, we're going to be taking a complete look at these clones considering their training, arsenal, classes, history, and much more. None of the Republic's clone troopers were perfect copies of Jango Fett. Their age was accelerated so that they would reach maturity in 10 years. Fett's allergies and similar defects were eliminated, and as a whole, the clones were made tougher, more intelligent, and more aggressive. But most clones also had their behavioral patterns altered. They were made more obedient, more social, and better suited to teamwork, in contrast to the defiant and antisocial Jango Fett. This, the Kaminoans believed, made them better soldiers, but it also made them much less independent and also a bit less creative. During the early stages of the Clone Trooper program, Fett suggested the Kaminoans produce a batch of clones that lacked these behavioral alterations for use in covert or otherwise delicate missions that the rank and file clones wouldn't be suited for. This led to the beginning of the Clone Commando program, as part of which the Kaminoans grew 10,000 clones with less extensive behavioral modifications. On Fett's urging, however, Kaminoans also made a small batch of clones with no behavioral modifications at all. These were named the ARC Troopers by the Kaminoans, aggressive recon commandos. The ARCs weren't fully unmodified clones. They still had accelerated aging, they lacked various minor genetic defects Fett had, and their intelligence and physical prowess were still greatly enhanced. But as far as their personalities were concerned, they were, as a clone commando once put it, pretty much pure Django. This made them incredibly effective. They weren't only extremely tough, but also intensely creative and, above all, fiercely independent. The Arcs were super soldiers, grown and trained to be one-man armies, the best of the best. But they weren't as soldierly as their common brethren. Arcs were loners, having inherited Django's antisocial tendencies, and they were also known to question or even outright disobey orders. 
Because of this, the Kaminoans feared the Ark Troopers. The first cohort of Arks, which were experimental and somewhat unstable, were too independent for their liking, and so the Kaminoans branded them as Null Class and slated them for termination. The Nulls were saved from an untimely demise by Cal Skarada, a Mandalorian whom Jango had brought on to train the clone commandos. However, the Kaminoans continued to have reservations about keeping them alive, and Skarada ultimately had to adopt them as his children to protect them. The next group of Arcs, which the Kaminoans labelled the Alpha class, were more stable, but they were still too unstable for the Kaminoans' liking. After their training was complete, the Kaminoans put these Arc Troopers in stasis in Topoka City to be activated only as a last resort. Fortunately for the Alphas, the need for a last resort came only two months into the Clone Wars following the First Battle of Kamino. As Topoka City was on the verge of falling to Separatist forces, Shakti convinced the Kaminoans to release the Ark Troopers. The Arcs immediately set to work and turned the tide of battle. Following this engagement, the Jedi realized the potential of the Ark Troopers and they began to be deployed on battlefronts the galaxy over. Technically, the Ark Troopers weren't part of the Grand Army of the Republic proper. They were part of the Republic Special Operations Brigade, a separate unit composed of the Republic's commandos. Even then, Arc Troopers typically operated autonomously of the standard rank structure. They worked solo or in small teams composed solely of commandos or arcs and some specially trained veteran clone troopers. Many arcs worked as liaisons to Jedi generals, acting as second in command of GAR units and oftentimes, arcs were given de facto authority far above that of their rank. With that said, arc troopers did have ranks and during the early years of the war, these were designated by the coloured stripes on their armour. Most ARC troopers had the rank of lieutenant, as indicated by their blue armour stripes, while others were captains and had red armour stripes. There was only one known ARC sergeant, a member of the Null ARCs, identified by his olive armour stripes, and a handful of ARCs received promotions to the rank of commander, identified by yellow stripes. Due to their status as elite commandos, Arc Troopers were afforded all manner of speciality equipment beyond what ordinary clones had access to. They had improved versions of the standard Phase 1 and Phase 2 armor sets, both of which were more protective and allowed for greater maneuverability, combining the best aspects of Phase 1 and Phase 2 kits. The HUDs in their helmets had a bunch of extra features, as did their gauntlets, which featured built-in hollow projectors, grappling hooks, and tasers. Arc armor also had attachment points for all manner of extra equipment that Arc Troopers and later Arc trained clone commanders were allowed to customize their armor with. The average Arc Trooper wore a Kama, a flexible armor weave skirt that protected the wearer's legs, and a pauldron, which provided extra protection around the chest area. Arc armor could also be upgraded with extra pouches, allowing Arcs to carry extra ammo, rations, grenades, small mines, and medkits. Arc helmets could be customized with range finders, and gauntlet plates could be further customized with miniature flamethrowers and rocket dart launchers. Many Arc Troopers wore small jetpacks. On top of all this, Arc Troopers had access to variant armors for use in specific situations. For example, Arc Heavy Gunners and Pilots had their own distinctive kits. Of course, Arc Troopers also had access to an ungodly large arsenal of weapons. On top of the standard DC-17 hand blasters, DC-15S blaster carbines, DC-15A blaster rifles, and DC-15X sniper rifles, ARC Troopers made regular use of heavy-duty Westar M5 blaster rifles, Z6 rotary cannons, PLX-1 portable missile launchers, and enormous reciprocating quad blasters. ARCs also had a broad selection of grenades, including standard frag charges, EMP and ion grenades, and reverse polarity pulse grenades. Some ARC Troopers were known to carry portable recon droids or HX2 anti-personnel mines. Now that we've got the basics covered, let's talk about the various classes of ARC Troopers, starting with the Nulls. As we mentioned earlier, the Nulls were the first batch of ARC Troopers produced by the Kaminoans, and they were experimental and unstable. Originally, the Nulls were a cohort of 12, but only 6 survived the gestation process. Described by Kaminoan scientist Uron Wa as highly intelligent, deviant, disturbed, and uncommandable, they were adopted and trained by Kal Skarada, a piece of work who trained the Nulls to be ultimate soldiers. 
The Nulls were the best of the best, even more so than the regular ARCs. Trained in black ops, assassination, medicine, slicing, counter-terrorism, and espionage. They were highly resistant to torture, had photographic memories, and their blaster accuracy ratios were second to none. They were also unpredictable and volatile, with some serious issues that Cal Skirata probably didn't help by training them to kill. In fact, Skirata made matters worse, and there's evidence to suggest that his training gave his sons PTSD. The Nulls would have done better to be adopted by a therapist, but instead, they spent their formative years being trained to lean into their anger issues so as to murder people better. On top of all this, Cal Skrider raised the Nulls as Mandalorians, which really just made them worse. Thus, not only were the Nulls semi-unhinged edgelord super soldiers, but they also saw themselves as honorable warriors, and they rationalized their flaws and issues as noble Mandalorian warrior stuff. Skrata named all six of them after Mandalorian warriors of old, or Mandawa words and concepts. Thus, Null 5 became Prudai, Mandawa for Shadow, Null 6 became Komruk, Mandawa for Gauntlet, Null 7 became Miriel, named after Super Commando Jastamiril, Null 10 became Jang, named after a Mandalorian mercenary from the time of the New Sith Wars, Null 11 became Ordo, named after Kandorus Ordo, and Null 12 became Arden, Mandawa for Rage named in honor of the anger issues none of the Nulls ever got treatment for. Each of the Nulls had their own personalities and special set of skills. All were lieutenants, except Ordo, who was a captain, and Arden, who was a sergeant. Prudai specialized in stealth and sabotage, especially in droid factories, and he was noted by his fellow clones for being a cynic and a wise-ass. Komruk specialized in intelligence gathering and torture, and he was quiet and extremely detail-oriented, which made him good at sniffing out lies. Muriel was considered carefree, charming, and sociable, a frequent haver of one-night stands and a known daredevil, skilled in counter-terrorism and genetics. He was also a lunatic, known for using a nerf prod to torture Kaminoan scientist Ko Sai into hanging herself after kidnapping her to get her to help him undo the clone's accelerated aging. Jang was an assassin, an expert sniper, slicer, and tracker. He was also a lunatic in good company. After the death of Kosai, Jang made a set of gloves out of her skin. Ordo was the leader of the Nulls. He was loyal and outspoken, the most serious of the Nulls, and he really hated the Jedi. Arden, last but not least, was jovial but quick to anger. He was sharply critical of Palpatine and the Republic, but for all the wrong reasons, namely because they weren't brutal enough to the Separatists. The Nulls were pretty much just Cal Skorata's private army, and their work happened in the background of the Clone Wars. After the Clone Wars ended, they lived with Skorata on his farm on Mandalore, taking on his clan name as their own. As you can probably tell, we have our own thoughts and opinions about how these clones were raised, but we'll spare you the details for now, and you can let us know what you think in the comments section below. For now, we'll move on to the Alpha Arcs, who weren't nearly as unhinged. The Kaminoans put out 100 Alpha-class ARC troopers, all of them exact psychological duplicates of Jango Fett. They were much more stable than their Null-class predecessors, and they were all trained personally by Jango Fett himself. While many of them had a liking for Mandalorian culture, or at least its trappings, most of them weren't the Mandaboos the Nulls were, and by and large, they were much less in need of intensive therapy, with one notable exception. With that said, they still had a tendency toward callousness, antisocial behavior, and stubborn defiance, much like Fett himself. The Alpha Arcs tended to be darker than their ordinary brethren, but they still got on decently well with the Jedi, and unlike the Nulls, they could actually function within a broader military framework. They were still one-man armies with that said, and their training was still second to none. While the Nulls had a real hate burner for any sort of orders that came from anyone who wasn't Cal Skorata, Jango raised the Alpha Arcs to follow their orders, except when those orders were dumb, in which case the Arcs wouldn't hesitate to correct their superiors and propose a better plan. Unbeknownst to the Kaminoans, Jango also trained the Arcs with special contingency orders to follow in case Topoka City was on the verge of falling, per which the Arcs would destroy the entire city to prevent the capture of young clones. In the words of Alpha 17, they grow up loyal to the Republic, or they don't grow up at all. During the Clone Wars, after their initial deployment in the First Battle of Kamino, the Alpha Arcs filled a variety of roles. 
Some worked solo or in small groups as commandos or infiltrators. Some, like Captain Fordo and the Munilence 10, formed their own elite units. And some, like Alpha 17, acted as clone liaisons to Jedi generals. The Alpha Arcs dominated whatever role they were given, often changing the courses of entire battles with impressive displays of combat skills. Out of the 100 Alpha class arcs, only one was aberrant, Alpha 2, also known as Spa. Spa was born not only with Jango Fett's personality, but also with some of his memories, which, as you might imagine, caused psychological issues that led him to deserting the Grand Army and striking out on his own. During the Clone Wars, Spa became the leader of the Mandalorian Protectors, a Separatist-aligned Mandalorian faction that took control of Mandalorian space and fought in several battles against the GAR. On the urging of his closest lieutenants, Spa claimed to be the son of Jango Fett and took the name Mandalore the Resurrector. He survived the Clone Wars, but most of his protectors didn't, and the loss of most of his followers left Spa with some serious trauma. In what seems to be a rarity for ARC troopers, Spa responded to this trauma by taking time for himself, retiring and giving up the title of Mandalore. He was later killed by Boba Fett's daughter after she mistook him for her father. The remaining 99 Alpha Arcs were all perfectly stable, and though a few more did desert over the course of the war, none of them joined the Separatists. These other deserters were Alpha 17, nicknamed Sul, and another who was nicknamed Tavo. There's a few other Arcs that we have names for, but know next to nothing about. There's Alpha 58, nicknamed Trantos, who was involved in a mission on the planet Zandias, Marek, who died trying to execute Order 66, and Arven, who fought in the Battle of Coruscant. There was also Alpha 66, Muzzle, who we'll talk about later, Mappa, who fought in the Battle of Pengolan 4, and Alpha 26, Maze, who was the clone liaison for Jedi General Arligan Zame, the commander of the Republic Special Operations Brigade. Some of the others are a bit more well known. If you're familiar with any of the Alpha Arcs, you probably know of Alpha 77, also known as Captain Fordo. Fordo was a major badass who commanded the Munilence 10, an elite Arc Trooper squad that included fellow Alpha Arc Steck, who was a heavy gunner. Fordo fought in the Battle of Munilence, the Battle of Hypori, and the Battle of Coruscant, and he displayed unbelievable skill time and time again. He was stoic and humble, known for refusing a commendation for his role in the Battle of Munilinst and insisting that it be given to a fallen member of his squad instead. He also worked quite well with the Jedi, whom he trusted near completely. A lesser known Ark Captain was Alpha 98, also known as Nate and later Jango Tat, who worked with Obi-Wan Kenobi and Kit Fisto in a mission on Ord Cestus. While on Ord Cestus, Alpha 98 bumped into a freedom fighter, Sheikha Tull, who had been a lover of Jango Fett. Jango Tat and Tal had a relationship of their own during the operation on Ord Cestus, which ultimately drove Jango Tat to sacrifice himself to liberate Ord Cestus, calling down a Republic orbital strike on his own position deep in Separatist territory. He was survived by Sheikha Tal, with whom he had conceived a child. Lastly, there's our favorite clone of all time, Alpha 17, everyone's favorite sarcastic gigachat. Alpha, as Anakin Skywalker called him, didn't take anyone's Sith, and he was known for deliberately provoking his Jedi superiors for fun, whether it was by giving Obi-Wan Kenobi extraordinarily callous strategy proposals, or telling the Padawan pack that service with them was a fate worse than death. After his debut appearance on Kamino, he was Obi-Wan Kenobi's first clone liaison, working with him and Anakin Skywalker from the Battle of Omar Dun to the Battle of Jabim. At Jabim, he and Kenobi were presumed killed in action, but had actually been captured by Asajj Ventress. Alpha survived weeks of torture in Ventress's dungeons on Rat Attack before he and Kenobi escaped. Following this incident, Alpha returned to Kamino, where he started a training program for clone commandos, which he taught them to think like ARC troopers to make them more effective. One of his first graduates, a man who called himself Cody, replaced him as General Kenobi's clone liaison. Near the end of the war, Alpha returned to combat, participating in the Battle of Boz Pity, where he was struck down by General Grievous. Despite being severely wounded and paralyzed from the waist down, Alpha insisted on continuing to fight, as his hands worked just fine. He was loaded onto a medical transport after the battle, following which he disappeared, as this transport was commandeered by Asajj Ventress, 
who took it to parts unknown. It's somewhat of an anticlimactic ending, but we like to think that Ventress and Alpha teamed up and got into all sorts of shenanigans in the unknown regions after the end of the war. In total, there were only 106 ARC troopers in the Kaminoans' original batches. But these numbers dwindled fast, and midway through the war, the surviving ARC troopers began recruiting regular clones who showed ARC trooper spirit to join their ranks. These weren't real ARC troopers in the sense that they weren't pure Django and were generally weaker, less independent and less creative, but they were still a step up from the regs and their increased autonomy as ARC troopers allowed them to harness their unique skills. It's ambiguous whether some ARC troopers were part of this batch or were original Alpha class ARC troopers. Several of these clones all had the rank of commander and fought in one of the battles of Kamino. Their names were Blitz, Colt, Havok and Hammer. Others in this category included the ARC troopers Cards and Karg, both of whom were also commanders. As for ARC troopers who are known to have been recruits, we have CT4547, nicknamed Hawk, CT1409, nicknamed Echo, CT5555, nicknamed Fives, and CT5597, nicknamed Jesse. Undoubtedly, you all recognize most of those names, and we doubt any of these clones need an introduction. These ARC inductees helped keep the ARC Trooper program afloat through to the end of the Clone Wars, but it didn't last long after that. For reasons we can't possibly guess at, the Empire really didn't like the idea of clones who disobeyed orders and were independent thinkers. Some ARC Troopers stuck with the Empire after the end of the war anyways, while some did not. A number of ARC Troopers hit out with Clan Skorada on Mandalore, and others, like Alpha 66 or Muzzle, as we mentioned earlier, became mercenaries. Muzzle became the leader of the Oridium Sword, a mercenary group that sold its services to criminal gangs, rebel cells, and Imperials alike. Muzzle wasn't anti-Empire per se, but he was pretty based in that he had a policy of accepting members of all species equally, accepting Wookiees into the organization as full and equal members, despite the Empire making them second-class citizens. A few ARCs were even more based and ended up joining the Rebel Alliance. It goes without saying that war is bloody, and this was just as true in the Star Wars universe as in reality. The Clone Wars in particular were extremely bloody, and depictions of that conflict rarely shied away from that fact. But in war, casualties don't always mean deaths, and in fact, the wounded typically outnumber the dead in all but the worst of massacres. This was true in the Clone Wars as well. Many clones were wounded, but not killed in battle, and as a result, medical units were necessary as part of the Grand Army of the Republic. The Republic Mobile Surgical Units, or RIMSUS for short, were the unsung heroes of the field, and in this video, we'll be giving these units the spotlight they deserve. In any given battle of the Clone Wars, there were many, many ways for a soldier to get hurt. Blaster bolts, of course, were the most obvious hazard, but there was also shrapnel, unchecked fires, concussive force from explosions, fumes and other debris clogging the air, environmental hazards, and much, much more to worry about. The Republic's clone troopers wore armor primarily to mitigate these secondary concerns so clones could focus on the blaster bolts, but that armor wasn't perfect, and there were still plenty of ways for clones to get wounded. A lot of the time, these hazards proved deadly, as you'd expect, but it's when they didn't that things got messy. The human body is quite complicated, and the extent and severity of a wound can be difficult to determine even when a person isn't covered in body armor, which can hide the extent of injuries. It was often very hard to tell whether wounded clones were about to die or were capable of pulling through, especially those that had gotten hit by blaster bolts. We're going to dwell on that example for a bit here, because getting shot by a blaster really was a messy ordeal, and understanding that is a big part of understanding what the Rimsus had to deal with on a daily basis. Blasters worked a lot differently than firearms work in our world, and they were more complicated than simple laser weaponry as well. Blasters fired blaster bolts, which is to say, concentrated packages of energized gas particles which dealt damage primarily through concussive force and the rapid transfer of kinetic energy. Essentially, when a blaster bolt hit a target, it caused a sudden rapid increase in heat and a massive transfer of kinetic energy. When a blaster bolt hit something like a concrete wall, this resulted in a small explosion and slightly deformed the point of contact, resulting in telltale blast points. 
but when a blaster bolt hit an organic target, the results were much messier. The bolts typically burned holes clean through organic targets, and what's more, the process of a bolt passing through organic tissue caused bodily fluids near the wounds to evaporate. As steam takes up more space than liquid, this meant that blood vessels and the like that happened to be near blaster wounds tended to explode as the bolt passed through, causing massive damage to any surrounding tissue. In short, they were quite uncivilized. This, for the record, is another reason why clone armor was so important. While it was impractical to mass produce armor that outright deflected blaster bolts, the kind of armor produced for clones could at least absorb some of the energy from a blast, minimizing internal damage. Nonetheless, the damage caused by a blaster wound was often far worse than it looked on the surface. If an unarmored soldier were to be shot in the shoulder, for example, even a surface wound had the potential to annihilate the whole shoulder's worth of tissue. In the real world, even a glancing blaster bolt to the shoulder would probably cost a person their arm. Thankfully for the clones, the Republic's medical technology was ahead of ours, and so the Rimsus were far better prepared to deal with blaster wounds in ways that didn't involve amputation. Like all organized fighting forces, the Republic dealt with its casualties in stages. As we've seen in Star Wars The Clone Wars, clones like Jesse were trained as medics, who provided immediate relief to wounded clones. Typically, these clones were aided by IM-6 medical droids, one of which was kept with an emergency medkit in standard issue medical lockers. These lockers were featured on most large Republic vehicles. One was located beneath the cockpit in the nose section of the LAAT gunships, for example, and another was located in the aft section of ATTE walkers. Clone medics and IM-6 droids helped triage wounded clones, which was no easy task. As in the real world, the wounded were divided between those with small injuries, those with extensive wounds, and those that were pretty much already dead. Medics typically took care of the first category with a quick shot of back or the application of bandages, while the third category were afforded what comfort could be spared as they took their final breaths. The second category, those with grievous injuries that had a chance of pulling through, were the cases that got sent to the Rimsus. Republic Mobile's surgical units were basically divisions within the Grand Army of the Republic that set up field hospitals on crucial battlefields. The number of Rimsus assigned to any given battle varied depending on the severity of the conflict. On Drongar, the site of one of the bloodiest battles of the Clone Wars, there were a grand total of 15 Rimsus set up, and even then, they had more wounded on their hands than they were equipped to deal with. Rimsus were manned by a mix of clone medics and soldiers, medical droids, and conscripted personnel, which included trained surgeons and nurses. Their job, of course, was to save as many clone lives as possible, and to make the clones whose lives they couldn't save a bit more comfortable as they died. Rimsus were typically hectic, as incoming cases could go from bad to worse quite quickly, and there were always more coming in. If you've seen MASH, it was basically a lot like that. In theory, Rimsus were capable of treating all but the most serious of injuries, but frequent supply shortages and the chaos of war meant that this wasn't always the case. For example, one of the most common dangers wounded clones faced was sepsis, which is a real-world side effect of infection in the body which has an extreme reaction to bacteria or certain chemicals, causing swelling and, in many cases, cascade organ failure. Due to how utterly blast bolts ravaged tissue, sepsis was a danger for a great many wounded clones. Now, Rimsus were equipped with anti-sepsis fields, energy umbrellas that effectively solved the problem by killing bacteria and neutralizing chemical agents, which meant that, in theory, sepsis shouldn't have been a problem in field hospitals. However, shortages of supplies and staff meant that there sometimes weren't enough fields, and doctors weren't always able to catch clones that needed them, meaning that sepsis deaths did indeed occur, and Rimsus staff had to work doubly hard to prevent them. Rimsus were equipped with other heavy-duty medical tech as well, especially Bacta. Bacta, as many of you know, was a chemical agent that rapidly regenerated tissue and thus was capable of healing a massive variety of wounds. Bacta patches were often applied to wounded clones as a means of stabilizing them, and Bacta tanks were frequently used for serious cases, though shortages often meant that serious cases had to be stabilized the good old-fashioned way. For the most extreme cases, Rimsus were even equipped with medical issue cloning tanks, which could generate organs for transplanting, 
But not every medical issue can be solved with technology. You can't just take a wounded clone, chuck him in a back to tank and hope he comes out okay. Wounds needed to be treated in detail first and that's where the surgical side of Republic Mobile surgical units came in. The most crucial part of these units were the surgeons, doctors recruited from across the Republic to serve on the front lines. These being stabilized serious injuries and patched up clones enough for the back to tanks to finish the job and were thus essential in ensuring the survival of a good many clones. One of the most important assets for a room suit to have was a Jedi healer. These weren't guaranteed to every unit, as Palpatine wanted Jedi on the front lines instead of doing their jobs. But no amount of Sith plotting could change the fact that the Jedi were natural healers and as a result, many of them served with the Rimsus, proving essential in saving countless lives. A number of Jedi that were particularly skilled in healing practically worked full time with the Rimsus, including Barriss Offi, who spent months with Rimsu 7 on Drongar. In fact, it's quite possible that the carnage Offi witnessed with the Rimsus on Drongar inspired her radicalization and fall to the dark side. There were many units in the Grand Army of the Republic that could be considered elite, ranging from the 501st Legion to the 41st Elite Corps to the Munilent 10. The largest such unit, as far as we know, was the Galactic Marines. Known mostly from their appearance in Mygido in Revenge of the Sith, the Galactic Marines were Kiati Mundi's personal favourite unit of clone troopers and was considered one of the most effective in the entire Republic. Despite this, however, very little is seen of the Galactic Marines, be it in canon or legends. In this video, we'll be exploring why. When the Grand Army of the Republic was deployed at the start of the Clone Wars, the Galactic Marines didn't actually exist. Instead, the men who would become the first Galactic Marines were members of the 21st Nova Corps, a unit in the 4th Sector Army. The 21st Nova Corps, as far as we know, was trained no differently than the rest of the clone units were. However, through some combination of factors, the men of the unit were above average, something that eventually came to be recognized. The 21st Nova Corps was led by Clone Marshal Commander CC1138, commonly known as Bakara. Bakara was a bit of a loner for a clone, but was an exceptionally effective commander. Alongside Commander Neo, Bakara developed military tactics that became commonplace in the use of UTATs and Bark Speeders, and made the 21st Nova Corps into one of the Grand Army's most effective units, especially after he participated in commander retraining under Alpha 17. Bakara was known to unilaterally reassign clones that didn't meet his high standards, ensuring that the 21st Nova Corps was composed of only the best clones in the Republic. Their effectiveness was only augmented by Bakara's tactics, which were unwaveringly ruthless and aggressive. Bakara and the 21st Nova Corps served with a number of Jedi, but for most of the war, they served under Kiadi Mundi, a high-ranking member of the Jedi Council. Mundi and Bakara made an excellent team and developed a mutual respect for each other despite numerous disagreements. Mundi was disturbed by Bakara's aggression and perfectionism, which he reported several times, but nonetheless appreciated his effectiveness in command of the Nova Corps. Several months into the war, as the Grand Army of the Republic began to diversify in order to create more specialized units, Mundi made the 21st Nova Corps into a separate unit that he and Bakara would lead, which came to be known as the Galactic Marines. The Galactic Marines were intended to serve as a rapid response siege unit designed for maximum versatility. They were trained for combat in all possible scenarios on the ground, underwater or in space, including in inhospitable conditions. They were especially skillful in planetary assault and shipboarding roles, and were used to capture enemy vessels numerous times during the Clone Wars. The Galactic Marines had unique armor designed for use in a greater variety of environments, which most notably included mesh face masks that kept out snow, sand or ash. After their creation, the Galactic Marines quickly gained a reputation as among the Republic's finest. In 22 BVY, the Galactic Marines are known to have fought on Renvar and Argonar, both of which were very inhospitable worlds, with the former being an ice planet and the latter being a desert. It's also possible, though unconfirmed, that the Galactic Marines fought in the battles of Liana and Hypori, as Kiadi Mundi was present at both. If they did, however, then they suffered exceptionally high casualty rates both times. 
Kiari Mundi fought in the Battle of Geonosis, but it's unknown if the Galactic Marines were with him. While Mundi's clone liaison for the battle was Commander Jet, not Commander Bakara, it is possible that Jet's unit, which was comprised of specialized clone troopers, was actually part of the Galactic Marines. While this is pure speculation, it's definitely possible, especially since Jet's unit has never been named. After the Second Battle of Geonosis, Kiari Mundi's appearances are limited to Jedi Council meetings, most of which he was only present for by hologram. This leaves nearly an 18 month gap between his appearance in combat on Geonosis and his next appearance at the start of the Outer Rim Sieges, with one exception that we'll get into later. The Galactic Marines don't appear at all, save during our exception during the space of time. They're absent for even longer if our theory about Geonosis is discounted. The Galactic Marines finally make their reappearance at the start of the Outer Rim Sieges, when, under Kiari Mundi, they fought in the Battle of Boz Pity. For the assault on Boz Pity, the Jedi Council sends its best and brightest Jedi and their clone units to attack a confederate stronghold, which was believed to be hosting Count Dooku, General Grievous and Asajj Ventress at the same time. The Republic passed the CIS blockade of Boz Pity in the Star Destroyer Intervention, which crash landed on the planet. Mundi led the Galactic Marines away from the crash site and, in conjunction with many other elite units, was eventually able to capture the CIS military base on the planet. Not long after, the Galactic Marines are known to have been fighting in the Outer Rim Siege's Sereno Theater, in which the Republic attempted to reclaim a swath of Separatist space on the Outer Hidian, which included key Separatist political powerhouses like Dooku's homeworld of Sereno and the hyperspace crossroads of Solanon. The assault in the Sereno Theater began with a strip of worlds that bordered the Radama Void, and the Galactic Marines, in particular, were assigned to capture New Bornelix. In one well-documented skirmish on New Bornelix, the Galactic Marines were given prototype space trooper armor suits, which granted them enhanced strength, protection, and firepower. During the battle, however, the weapons of the suits all failed. Instead of ordering a retreat, however, Commander Bakara ordered the Marines to engage the enemy battle droids in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the Marines resorted to literally ripping apart enemy super battle droids with their enhanced strength. The Galactic Marines assumedly also fought the Mandalorian protectors that were present in the battle, over whom they also emerged victorious, taking new Bornelix for the Republic. A detachment of the Galactic Marines also fought in the Battle of Tula at the end of the Clone Wars, which was made necessary by Tula's inhospitable cold conditions. Neither Mundi nor Bakara was involved in the battle, however. The Marines present on Tula were instead led by Jedi Generals Sims and Hodora, alongside Commander Keller. The Galactic Marines eventually won this battle as well, albeit only after the execution of Order 66 and the deactivation of the droid armies. Even if you don't count some of the speculation here, that's a decently long list of battles to be fair. But most of them are clustered either at the beginning or the end of the war, and some of them didn't even involve the whole unit. The question then still remains, what were the Galactic Marines doing for the rest of the war? The answer lies in that exception we mentioned earlier, the opening phases of the Battle of Megiddo. In the later half of 21 BBY, the Republic began an assault on the intergalactic banking clan stronghold world of Megiddo. After the Battle of Munilinst, Megiddo had become the IGBC's primary military staging world, and on top of that, it was rich in rare energy crystals. The IGBC considered it a vault world, the Republic on the other hand, considered it a target. The Delta Squad was responsible for the initial actions on Megiddo and notably sabotaged enemy ground defenses in preparation for a larger assault. Kiari Mundi and the Galactic Marines were assigned to Megiddo for the said assault, exploiting the opening that the Delta Squad had made to land their troops across the planet and besiege enemy strongholds. But despite their early advantage, the Battle of Megiddo quickly ground to a stalemate, a stalemate that lasted for the rest of the war. The Battle of Megiddo was the longest battle of the Clone Wars, outlasting even the Battle of Atrakin and the Battle of Drongar. From 21 BBY to 19 BBY, the battle went on mostly unchanging, claiming the lives of untold numbers of clone troopers. It's unknown whether the Galactic Marines were present for the entire battle, but their conspicuous absence from most of the war implies that they were, or at least partly. It's even possible that the bulk of the unit was briefly transferred to Boz Pity and New Bornelix to compensate for unit shortages during the Outer Rim sieges before being transferred back, though that is of course speculation. 
Near the end of the Clone Wars, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine ramped up the Battle of Mygido, declaring it a priority target and assigning massive assault fleets to reinforce Republic forces already present on the world. If the Galactic Marines weren't already fully deployed on Mygido by this point, then they certainly were after it, and at long last started to make progress. Shortly before the Battle of Coruscant, they were joined in battle by the 501st Legion, which had been secretly assigned by Supreme Chancellor Palpatine to collect energy crystals for a certain Superlager project. The Galactic Marines continued fighting on Mygido as the events of Revenge of the Sith played out. In one particular part of the battle, Kyari Mundi and Commander Bakara led the Marines in a charge across a key bridge that divided Republic and Separatist held parts of Mygido only for Bakara to receive Order 66. In the Galactic Marines' most well-known appearance, they gunned down Mundi on Bakara's orders and went on to capture Mygira themselves. They were later reformed into the Imperial Galactic Marines. In summary, the Galactic Marines were seen relatively little during the Clone Wars because, for more than half of the war, they were busy fighting on Mygira. It's a real shame, as it would have been amazing to see them in action in Star Wars The Clone Wars. Regardless, what did you think of the video? Do you have any suggestions for any other longer videos that we can make in the future? Post your thoughts in the comments section below. And it's also worth noting guys that we do have a whole video on Commander Bakara and Commander Keller, both of the clone commanders for the Galactic Marines, which I'll link in the end screen right after this. So make sure you check it out and check out all the links in the description below to play some of our community games such as Gmod, Roblox, and to check me out on Patreon if you want to help to make the channel a little bit better than it is at the moment. Anyways guys, as always, thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video and make sure you check out those Commander Profile videos. The 501st Legion was perhaps the most well-known military unit in the entire Star Wars universe. From the Clone Wars to the Galactic Civil War and beyond, the elite troops of the 501st doggedly carried out the will of the Galactic Government crushing resistance at every turn. During the Clone Wars, the 501st was one of the most elite units of regular clones in the Grand Army of the Republic, serving under General Anakin Skywalker. Under the Empire, the 501st became Vader's fist, composed only of the most ruthless stormtroopers. In this video, we'll be telling the full legend story of the 501st, from Geonosis to Endor and beyond. First things first, let's talk about legions. Legions weren't actually a formal part of the GAR command structure. Rather, legion was just a nickname for elite units. The 501st was actually a brigade which was in the upper middle of the GAR's order of battle. Brigades were composed of 9,216 troopers which subdivided into 4 regiments, 16 battalions, 64 companies, 256 platoons and 1,024 squads. Each brigade was commanded by a senior commander and a Jedi general. Structurally, the 501st was no different from other brigades, at least not at first. Though it was important, as early on in the Kaminoans cloning program, the unit was selected for special treatment. On the request of the Grand Army's shadowy backers, the Kaminoans selected the 501st to receive top-notch training, organizing the best performing clone trainee squads into the Legion. By the time the Clone Wars kicked off, the 501st was already the best of the batch. It was also one of the first clone units to be battle ready and saw action in the war's very first engagement. In the Battle of Genosis, the 501st served on General Windu's battlefront, establishing forward positions and escorting ATTE walkers in an assault on the Techno Union's grounded hard cell transports. On Genosis, the 501st had its first clash with the CIS droid army. The battle was bloody and, as one veteran later recounted, nothing like the simulations on Kamino, but it ended with a Republic victory and most of the 501st made it off Genosis alive. After Genosis, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine recalled the 501st Legion to Coruscant. There, the 501st was put through a top secret training regimen, christening the unit as the Chancellor's Elite. The 501st was informed that it would be called upon to carry out special missions for Palpatine, a duty the Legion's clones accepted. After this additional training was complete, 
members of the 501st were sprinkled throughout other clone units to serve as the Chancellor's personal agents, and the rest of the Legion was sent to the front lines. The 501st participated in many battles during the early months of the Clone Wars, with many of its subdivisions acting as reinforcements for other units. In the early war, the 501st had no permanent commander rotating between different theatres of war. This changed at the end of 22 BBY, when the entire 501st was placed under the command of the newly promoted General Skywalker. Skywalker made Captain Rex his second in command, a significant break in the typical command structure. Unlike many early war clone officers, Rex wasn't originally a captain. He had been promoted from private for heroic actions during the Battle of Genosis, and he had risen through the ranks until he was in command of Torrent Company. From there, he leapfrogged four whole ranks to take command of the entire Legion on Skywalker's prerogative. Why Anakin didn't just promote Rex to senior commander is beyond us, as he certainly had the authority to, but we digress. Under Rex's de facto command, Torrent Company became the spearhead of the 501st, leading the charge as the 501st saw action on new battlegrounds. Late in 22 BBY, the Legion played a critical role in the Battle of Christosis, acting as the vanguard of the Republic force in the retaking of Chelidonia, the capital. During the battle, Ahsoka Tano was assigned as General Skywalker's new Padawan, integrating her into the 501st's command structure. Tano was instrumental in the eventual Republic victory on Christosis and was readily accepted by the clones of the 501st as their new Jedi commander. After Christosis, Skywalker, Tano, Rex, and Torrent Company transferred to Teth, where they launched an assault against a separatist held monastery where Dooku's agents were holding Jabba the Hutt's son, Rota, prisoner. While Skywalker and Tano rescued the Hutlet and headed to Tatooine, Torrent Company fought nearly to the last man while defending the monastery against a second wave of Separatist forces. The timely arrival of reinforcements saved the Torrent Company from being wiped out entirely, but by the end of the battle, Rex was down to just five troopers. Torrent Company's numbers were soon replenished, but Rex was nonetheless distraught at the loss of his brothers and the scars of Teth lingered long after the battle. Rex had little time to mourn, however. As soon as it was at fighting strength, Torn Company was sent back to the front lines. It played a key role in the Battle of Bothawoy, destroying several of General Grievous's cruisers with asteroid-mounted ATTEs, and a detachment of Torn Company helped destroy Skytop Station, a major Separatist listening post. Rex and six troopers from Torrent Company also played a major role in the Battle of Janfathal, rescuing Republic operative Helena Davis, who had been captured by Separatist rebels opposed to Janfathal's tyrannical pro-Republic government. Torrent Company and the rest of the 501st remained on the front lines well into 21 BBY. As other detachments of the 501st assisted embattled clone units on other fronts, Torrent Company helped evacuate Republic forces during the Battle of Quell and recaptured a crucial Bothan Spinet facility from General Grievous in the Battle of Cothlis. The Battle of Cothlis was one of the 501st's finest hours, but it also severely depleted Torrent Company once again, landing Rex and many other clones in back to tanks. They recovered quickly enough to participate in the Battle of Ryloth, where Torrent Company mopped up Separatist forces at the remote city of Resden. In case you couldn't tell, Torrent Company had a tendency to suffer extreme casualties. In the early war, when the 501st was typically split up and Torrent Company operated solo, Rex lost nearly all of his men on multiple occasions, so he was always looking to recruit new troopers from other units. Many of these new recruits didn't last, fueling Rex's enduring guilt. As a veteran of the 501st would later remark, the Legion truly saw the worst of the war. After Ryloth, the 501st Legion was deployed more frequently as a whole unit. The Legion kept suffering heavy casualties, losing many men in the First Battle of Felucia and the Battle of Malastare, but it no less remained integral to the Republic war effort. After Malastare, the 501st was one of several major clone units to participate in the Second Battle of Genosis, following up on intel gathered by Captain Rex about new Separatist droid factories. The 501st joined in the grueling first landing at Point Rain, and for once, it suffered fewer casualties than its accompanying units, allowing Skywalker and his men to lead the assault on the Geonosian's main factory. 
While Commander Tano and Barris Offi sabotaged the factory from inside, the 501st provided a distraction at the factory gates. After the main factory was destroyed, the 501st took charge of mop-up duty, with detachments from the Legion putting down Genosian holdouts across the planet. Throughout 21 BBY, the 501st fought in a number of other important battles. On Seleucami, it participated in an unsuccessful mission to capture General Grievous, who had been shot down following a pitched space battle. When the Republic learned of an impending Separatist assault on Kamino, the 501st was recalled to defend the Grand Army's homeworld. The Legion fought ferociously against the Separatist invaders and narrowly managed to stave them off, though yet again, this came at a high cost. Two troopers from the 501st, Fives and Echo, played an especially important role in the battle for which they were made ARC troopers. As ARCs, Echo and Fives became independent, but they continued to work with the Legion on key missions. Late in 21 BBY, the Kamino and Armorsmiths unveiled brand new Phase 2 armor, which was quickly adopted across the GAR. Prior to the switch, many clones in the 501st painted their armor with blue stripes, but the adoption of Phase 2 made this color scheme the official signifier of the Legion. Not everyone in the 501st was happy with the change of gear though. Captain Rex had mixed feelings about it, so he ended up hybridizing his new kit with his old Phase 1 suit, welding parts of both sets together to create what was, in his opinion, the perfect suit of clone armor. The 501st's new gear first saw action in the Battle of Umbara, one of the bloodiest conflicts of the entire war. Early in the battle, General Skywalker was recalled to Coruscant and the 501st was placed under the temporary command of General Pong Krell. Krell drove the 501st into minefields and through narrow jungle passes, incurring heavy casualties at every turn. By this point, however, Rex had stocked the Legion with some of the most independent-minded clones in the Grand Army. They weren't as willing to take Krell's abuse as most clones would have been. At first, the 501st simply worked around Krell, finding creative solutions to the problems he landed the unit in. But as casualties mounted, some of Rex's men began openly defying orders. This culminated in three clones stealing captured Umbaran starfighters and destroying a Separatist battleship in orbit, which turned the tide of the battle but infuriated General Krell. He ordered the clones to be executed, but the men of the 501st refused to carry out the order. In retaliation, Krell orchestrated a friendly fire incident in the jungle, pitting the 501st against a platoon from the 212th Attack Battalion. Many clones perished in the skirmish, and when it was discovered that Krell orchestrated it, Rex and his men chose to arrest Krell for treason. After a short battle, the traitorous Jedi General was subdued and executed. Around the same time, the 212th captured the Umbaran capital. The battle was won, but the 501st, as usual, had suffered enormously for the victory, and none of its men would readily forget the treachery of General Krell. In 20 BBY, Ahsoka Tano left the Jedi Order and was stripped of her rank in the GAR. Many in the 501st were saddened by her departure, but neither they nor General Skywalker had much time to mourn. The demands of the war brought the Legion to Ringo Vinda, where the 501st and other clone units fought a back and forth war against Admiral Trench's armies. The 501st came close to breaking the stalemate, but Republic forces lost their momentum after Tup, one of Rex's men, suddenly executed Jedi General Tipla mid-battle. Tup's erratic behavior baffled the remaining Jedi Generals, and while Republic intelligence chalked it up to a Ringo Vindian parasite, it still cost the Republic the battle. The 501st returned to Coruscant and later participated in the Battle of Scipio, seizing the crucial banking clan world for the Republic. General Skywalker, Captain Rex, and the rest of the 501st continued to fight on the front lines for the rest of the war. In canon, they stuck together until the Battle of Coruscant when Rex and the 332nd Battalion detached and fought in the Siege of Mandalore. The Siege of Mandalore isn't a thing in Legends, however, so we won't be discussing it in this video. Regardless, at one point in the latter days of the war, Senior Commander Apo replaced Rex as the de facto leader of the 501st Legion. Now, at this point, we need to pause to discuss continuity, and not just because of Mandalore. If you've played the original Battlefront 2, you know that it's time for us to discuss the Journal of the 501st, which told the story of the Legion's missions in the final days of the war. 
But there's one small problem with the journal of the 501st. It can't possibly be correct. All but one of the missions in the journal would have had to happen over the space of just three days, which means that either the timeline the journal presents is wrong or different detachments of the 501st carried out the missions, and thus the narrator's implication that he was present for all of them is wrong. We're going to go with the second assumption, mostly because the 501st veteran story is improbable in more ways than one continuity snarl. If we take his version of events literally, then this clone served on the front lines for 25 years straight, and he would have been 70 by the time of the last battle he claims to have served in. With that in mind, we're going to write him off and go with our different detachments theory for all Journal of the 501st material going forward. Hope that makes sense, and without further ado, let's get back into the story. In 19 BBY, the 501st Legion was one of many clone units assigned to the Outer Rim Sieges. Detachments of the 501st fought all over the galaxy, in hotspots, and wherever else the Chancellor wanted them to. Very late in the war, one such detachment of the 501st was sent to Mygido to fight alongside Kiari Mundi and the Galactic Marines. Officially, they were to help Mundi capture a key Mygitan city, but they had actually been sent to further Project Hamatong, the Republic's secret super laser project. On Mygido, the 501st stole a special Mygidan power crystal and destroyed all evidence of the theft, all without Mundi suspecting a thing. Not long afterwards, the main detachment of the Legion was stationed on Coruscant. When General Grievous attacked, 501st troopers helped the Coruscant Guard fight the droid invasion forces on the ground, while other members of the Legion were pressed into service as reserve fighter pilots. With their help, the Battle of Coruscant was eventually won, but the 501st had little time to celebrate. After the Confederacy's defeat on Coruscant, the Republic launched a massive counterattack, its armies and fleets bolstered by vast numbers of reinforcements that had been held in reserve at Coruscant. The 501st was divided up into smaller units and sent into the fray on several fronts. One detachment of the Legion was sent to Felucia, where it cleared a staging ground for the 327th Star Corps. Another was sent to Kashyyyk, where it punched a hole in the Separatist blockade and assisted in the early stages of the battle at Kachiro. Yet another accompanied General Kenobi in the 7th Star Corps to Utapau, where General Grievous was slain and another Separatist army was routed. On all three fronts, the 501st was wildly successful, and within just a few days of the Battle of Coruscant, the CIS was on the verge of defeat. But just before the war came to an end, the 501st was recalled to Coruscant for one last mission. The whole 501st Legion was, once again, placed under the command of General Skywalker, now Darth Vader, and Commander Apo. As night fell on Coruscant, Vader and Apo led the Legion in a march on the Jedi Temple. As Order 66 was issued all over the galaxy, the 501st carried out Operation Nightfall, storming the temple and killing every Jedi they encountered. Vader and the clones slaughtered thousands of Jedi that day, as well as the remaining members of the temple security force. Once the Jedi were slain, the clones secured the temple, which was partially set ablaze during the battle. Vader issued the temple's automatic recall beacon, summoning any surviving Jedi back to Coruscant. Commander Apo organized decoy squads of clones dressed in Jedi robes to kill any survivors who took the bait. The 501st failed to stop Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi from returning to the temple prior to their self-imposed exiles, but they killed several Jedi who fell into their trap, as well as others that were found at the temple. The 501st Legion's actions during Operation Nightfall earned the Legion's men a reputation as Jedi killers, and in the Great Jedi Purge, the 501st was sent all over the galaxy to deal with rogue Jedi, as its troopers possessed more experience in that field than any other clones. After Operation Nightfall, the Republic was reorganized into the Galactic Empire. The men of the 501st Legion became stormtroopers, though at first this change was purely symbolic. While the 501st had been just one brigade under the Third System's army, under the Empire it was an independent entity within the Stormtrooper Corps. It answered to Vader and the Emperor only. During the transition period, other parts of the Grand Army of the Republic were rolled into the 501st Legion, including the Republic Special Operations Brigade. All surviving clone commandos and ARC troopers were organized into the Imperial Commando Special Unit, which was attached to the 501st and followed the same command structure. During the Reclamation of the Rim, the Empire's campaign against the Separatist holdouts, 
The 501st Legion was brought in to crush particularly tough Separatist cells and rebels associated with Jedi survivors. On Kessel, Apo and the 501st helped Lord Vader slaughter a conclave of eight Jedi survivors, while on New Plimpto, Commander Vil of the Legion crushed a Jedi-led holdout in the Battle of Half Axe Pass. On Mercana, Vader and the 501st tried to kill a few more Jedi survivors, only for the Jedi to escape. Vader, Apo, and their troops pursued the Jedi to Kashyyyk, where a fierce battle against the Jedi survivors and their Wookiee allies ensued. The 501st ultimately won the battle, but Apo was killed in the fighting. He was replaced by Commander Vokka, who didn't last long. He and many other 501st stormtroopers were murdered by traitorous commandos during a mission to the Otoa system. By the start of the Dark Times, the 501st Legion had gained a reputation for its brutality and efficiency, earning the nickname Vader's Fist. The men of the 501st gradually did away with their old Clone Wars era gear, abandoning their iconic blue color scheme in favor of bright white stormtrooper armor. One of their first missions after the armor upgrade was an assault on Naboo, which was threatening violent insurrection against the Empire. On Vader's orders, the 501st assassinated Queen Apelana and her guard, as well as several Jedi she had been sheltering, allowing the Empire to install a new puppet regime on the planet. While this incident set an example to many other would-be rebel worlds, the 501st was nonetheless called upon to put down similar insurrections many times during the reign of the Empire. Early rebel cells weren't the 501st's only enemies during the Dark Times either. Vader's Fist crushed a number of persistent Separatist holdouts after the campaign against them officially ended, with the most notable being Geysor Delso's 12 BBY Rebellion on Mustafa. Like many Dark Times era holdouts, Delso had found a warehouse of deactivated battle droids and switched them back on. His insurrection was different however. He had found a whole factory and had managed to reactivate a fleet of warships to protect it, but the 501st punched through this blockade and at length, Delsa was killed and his factory destroyed. This was a close call for the Legion, as Delsa was designing a new advanced battle droid line, which, luckily for the Empire, never saw the light of day. Shortly after that, the 501st crushed an even worse threat to Imperial supremacy, the Kaminoan Clone Rebellion. As the Stormtrooper Corps began making use of other cloning facilities, the Kaminoans felt threatened and they bred a second army of anti-troopers in secret. Once this was complete, Kamino tried to break away from the Empire and become its own galactic power. Naturally, the 501st Legion was sent in to end this threat, assisted by bounty hunter Boba Fett. The Kaminoans put up a fierce resistance, but not even they could walk off a Vader's fisting. The rogue Kaminoan clone masters were taken out and their operations were dismantled. In the years that followed, the Stormtrooper Corps all but abandoned Kamino, opting to recruit natural-born humans or buy clones from other clone masters instead. The 501st remained mostly pure, but the rest of the Stormtrooper Corps rapidly diversified. As the dark times went on, the 501st remained the most feared legion in the Stormtrooper Corps, but a full decade of little resistance to the Empire caused the legion and the rest of the Imperial military to atrophy. They became complacent, and as often happens, their complacency ultimately bit them in the ass. The first signs of this came in 2BBY when the 501st had a hard time putting down a prisoner riot during a rotation aboard the Death Star. Things would only get worse for the 501st, if better for the rest of the galaxy. Later that year, the Alliance to Restore the Republic rose up against the Empire. The Empire didn't take the Rebellion seriously at first, but as the Alliance grew bolder and gained ground, the Imperials realized that it posed a serious threat. More than once, the 501st Legion was called in to put down rebel cells, and even they had a tough time with it. Before long, a full-scale civil war erupted. Two years into the Galactic Civil War, the rebels captured the schematics of the recently completed Death Star, and Vader and the 501st Legion were called in to recapture the plans. The hunt first led the Legion to Polis Massa, where they fought a grueling battle against the Rebels, only to find that the plans were on the other side of the galaxy. The Legion rejoined Vader aboard the Star Destroyer Devastator and pursued a team of Rebel operatives to Toproa, where the Death Star plans were transmitted to the Tantive IV, a consular ship belonging to Princess Leia of Alderaan. 
The Devastator pursued the Tensai IV from Toparawa to Tatooine, where the 501st Legion captured the ship after a brief but heated firefight. Of course, as we all know, the Death Star plans escaped the Tensai IV aboard a pair of droids, and the Rebels ended up destroying the Death Star in the Battle of Yavin. Two thirds of the 501st Legion perished aboard the Death Star when it blew up, and the survivors were scattered. Shocked and outraged that the Rebels were evil enough to destroy their giant genocide ball, the remainder of the 501st regrouped with Imperial Navy units in the Yavin system, which had formed a blockade of the Forest Moon. This blockade remained in place for six months, destroying numerous Rebel warships that attempted to escape. Six months after the Battle of Yavin, Darth Vader took command of the blockade from the bridge of his new flagship, the Star Dreadnought Executor. Once the Executor arrived in the Yavin system, Imperial forces began a ground assault on the Alliance's secret headquarters. The 501st Legion led the assault on the Masasi base, slaughtering any rebel soldiers that got in their way, assassinating several members of the Alliance leadership and capturing General Dodona. However, only a small portion of Alliance leadership had been present on Yavin to begin with. The vast majority of the rebel fleet and all of its commanding officers were scattered throughout the galaxy, as was the political leadership of the Alliance and the rebel leaders that escaped Yavin regrouped with them in short order. Together with Death Squadron, a fleet group led by the Executor, the 501st Legion spent the next three years hunting the rebels, especially Princess Leia and the Alliance's newest hero, Luke Skywalker. In 3 ABY, after many unsuccessful attempts at capturing key rebel leaders, the rebels' new base was discovered on Hoth. Darth Vader ordered it to be destroyed from orbit, but Death Squadron emerged from hyperspace too close to Hoth. The Rebels activated Echo Base's shields before the Executor could bomb it to hell, necessitating a ground assault. Together with Blizzard Force, the 501st Legion deployed on Hoth and stormed Echo Base, which was ultimately captured and destroyed. Roughly half of the Echo Base garrison escaped Hoth, including numerous important leaders, but the Battle of Hoth was nonetheless a decisive victory for the Empire. Veterans of the 501st would consider the battle to be the Legion's finest hour. After Hoth, the Rebel Alliance seemed to be on the verge of defeat. What was left of the Alliance regrouped with the Rebel fleet and fled known space, giving the Imperials a false sense of security. However, Lord Vader and Emperor Palpatine knew full well that the Rebels were still out there and growing stronger by the day. Hoping to eliminate the Alliance once and for all, the Emperor planned a trap in the Endor system, where a second Death Star was under construction. In the Battle of Endor, the entire Rebel fleet was lured into attacking the second Death Star, which the Emperor was known to be aboard. The Rebels planned to send a strike force to the Forest Moon of Endor, where the external shield generator that protected the Death Star was stationed. The Rebel fleet was to jump in just as the shield was destroyed, allowing them to take out the Death Star and Emperor in one swift move. Of course, this is exactly what Palpatine had expected them to do. Death Squadron and hundreds of other Imperial warships were waiting for them, while the 501st Legion, Tempest Force and other elite Stormtrooper units were waiting on the moon itself. The 501st prevented the Rebel ground team from destroying the bunker, and when the Rebel fleet arrived, it found itself under fire from a fully operational Death Star. Before the fleet could escape, more Star Destroyers arrived to close the trap, but the Emperor's plan went sideways. On the forest moon, the rebels allied with the indigenous Ewoks, who massacred Tempest Force and the 501st, allowing the rebels to destroy the shield generator. With the shield down, the Death Star was swiftly destroyed. Vader, the Emperor, and two Grand Admirals were killed, and dozens of ships, including the Executor, were blown to smithereens. The Battle of Endor left the Empire in shambles, and the Alliance capitalized on this by formally becoming the New Republic. The remnants of the 501st Legion escaped Endor in disarray, and as the Empire fragmented, the Legion's surviving men were divided up by power-hungry warlords. Vader's fist met its end in the Battle of Endor, but the legacy of the original 501st Legion lived on. Five years after Endor, Grand Admiral Thrawn had more or less unified remnants of the Empire, which had been driven back into the Outer Rim by the ascendant New Republic. In 9 ABY, Thrawn reformed the 501st Legion capitalizing on the unit's infamy, albeit in a radically different form. The new 501st was almost entirely composed of recruited stormtroopers, many of them non-humans, as Thrawn recruited the best of the best, irrespective of species. 
The 501st's mission changed as well. It was assigned to defend the Empire of the Hand, an imperial vassal formed by Thrawn out in the remote reaches of the Unknown Regions. The reformed 501st Legion essentially sat out the rest of the Galactic Civil War. After Thrawn's death, the Empire of the Hand remained a secret known only to a few in the Empire, as did the 501st. By the time the reformation of the 501st Legion had become public knowledge, the Imperial Remnant had made peace with the New Republic. Nonetheless, the 501st Legion endured. It saw action during the Yuuzhan Vong War and survived long into the Legacy Era, when the Imperial Remnant became a new empire. By 137 ABY, the 501st Legion were the elite shock troopers of Emperor Rowan Fell, remaining a unit to be feared over 150 years after the founding of the original Legion. The 501st Legion was one of the most feared military units in galactic history, as befitting the personal death squad of an emotionally unstable Sith Lord. But what do you think? Did you know that the 501st had so much history? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and what your suggestions for the next long videos are. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.